World of Dreams is my favorite mod of all time. It's a story where the player themselves gets transported into the DDLC world and now has the chance to save everyone and give them their happy ending. The story isn't too complex, there's been a ton of mods already that try and tackle this idea, but what makes World of Dreams different is how it handles its plot, and most importantly, the way it chooses to portray this world. Most mods that I play just cover the four girls and don't really give you anything else, but World of Dreams chooses to dive in and establish a bit more world building and lore to help make this world feel different. It quickly establishes that it's both similar but different from the original game. Yes, this world might just be a game, but it's also been lifted. There's always this thought of, what if this world is more than just this game's counterpart? And there's a lot of reason to suspect this. The characters are no longer one note and have a lot more depth than you would imagine. The story makes a lot of changes, but also keeps all the main points that happened in the original. Always looming over your head that it's so similar, but couldn't be any more different than the previous game. Characters are similar, but they're not. I personally love them. They took the worst traits about these girls and made them so likable. The music is amazing. There's a lot of different tracks that play for specific moments that either have you feeling claustrophobic or warm or fuzzy. The list goes on. I was so invested when Act 1 was over, I didn't want to wait, and I would speculate and theorize with other people on how the story would go. I even wrote a bit of fanfiction on how I thought Act 2 would play out. And finally after, what, three years? Act 2 of World of Dreams is finally out. Uh, like four months ago. <laughs> I know I'm a little late. And after spending a very unhealthy amount of time streaming it and going through this mod and playing it, I can confidently say that this mod is a spectacular sequel that does everything the first part did, but better, but it's also conflicting. Act 2 had a lot to live up to, but somehow the sequel does the impossible and makes it seem like you never left. The writing is still very much on par with the previous and hasn't gotten any weaker. Even though a lot of time has passed, once you boot up the game, it's like you just flip to the next page and start reading the next chapter. It's seamless, and throughout this mod, it only continues to shine. But what this mod does in terms of getting to the end of its story can be a bit... overwhelming. And sometimes, even a bit frustrating, and we'll talk about that. <laughs> so join me on this journey of- oh my god, this is such a long video. <laughs> Let's go through the entire mod and see for ourselves what happens. And if you haven't already, subscribe. I make cool videos all the time. And by the way, I will be using Gamemonger's channel for the footage. I was going to use the footage for my livestream, but it turned out to actually be very low quality, and I don't really have the ability to re-record the entire mod again, so I'm sorry, but I will be using Gamemonger's footage. I hope you forgive me. Go check him out though, he's where I find out about all my DDLC mods, and uh, yeah, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> So, a quick summary of Act 1. Basically, our protagonist, who are referred to as the player, gets transported into the DDLC world and now is in control of the MC's body. And the goal is to try and save everyone from their fate of the original game. But as we continue through the story, we realize that just how close this world is to the original game. Cause spoiler alert, even after spending so much time trying to be friends with everyone and helping Monica see the world through a different coat of paint and try to prevent everyone's deaths, Sayori for some reason is still bound by the game's code and still tries to take theme park ride to the sewer slides, oh no. And we barely end up saving her. And this leaves everyone in a weird spot. And I'm just gonna say this, this is such a perfect cliffhanger. The setup, the emotions, the panicking, the uncertainty, the dogs barking in the background. It's all just so perfect. It leaves you wanting more and also panicking about what could happen next. So let's find out. So immediately opening up the mod again, we're taken to this installation screen with this World of Dreams version of Windows called Mirrors 97. We finished downloading the mod and we're taken to the main menu. And I had a lot of fun here because you can actually move these programs around, which is honestly so cool. I had no idea you can code stuff like this in. 10 out of 10 already. <laughs> The menu screen also has some very impressive art of the two worlds cut in half with Monica on one side and Natsuki and Yuri on the other. Which is sort of foreshadowing, kind of? I don't know, we'll see. So we enter our name and we move on right to where we left off. As soon as we press new game, we get this error message and an orange screen. It's kind of similar to the Windows blue screen, but in the top left corner, the world of DDLC is still being opened and restored. It's very interesting that even though the world has been altered and changed, it's still pushing to start up as it usually does. Act 2 startup screen finally shows up. Act 2. If def equals false. We start off right where we left off and honestly, it feels like we never left. The writing is still on point and that's something I always praise about this mod. How human and grounded it makes these characters. Something I also want to mention is if you all remember, there was this kind of, I don't know if you call it like an ARG? There were some secret messages and codes in the original DDLC files and one of those files has Monica relaying us a message. It's time to be a hero. This phrase is kind of the reason why the player is going so far and it's something that really comes full circle to the end which is what I really like, being a quote unquote hero. Something that is almost impossible in this scenario and I love that. The player realizes that just how fucked this whole situation is, and it's even worse when everyone is looking to him for some sort of guidance. For any sort of guidance. Yeah, he has some inner knowledge about what went down, but that only has taken us so far. And as we are about to see, it's going to be futile in the coming days. Nonetheless, figuring out a plan is the first thing we need to do. Monica, Meiji, and Sayori do their best to just talk through everything and figure out the next steps. 
along with figuring out what exactly happened to Sayori. As far as we knew, everything was fine. And Sayori confirms this, but apparently the world had a different idea. For some reason, there was a piece of rope hidden underneath Sayori's bed. The player blamed himself for not double checking, but there's a part of me that wonders if, if that even would have mattered, if that would have been enough. Sayori mentions that it felt like she was in a trance. It all happened so fast and there was nothing that we can do. There's still so much we don't understand. The music not only setting the tone for this, but also doesn't help with the whole mystery aspect of this. I've always liked this song, I'm glad it gets used for these moments, it, it really does do a lot. Especially with the glitched out menu outside of the windows, god that's terrifying. The crew then go to look at the game script and see that everything has been written down. As to be expected, the player notes that Sayori actually doing the deed is for some reason glitched out, I wonder why. And the player is being labeled as the hero. Ooh, remember what I said before? Oh my god. The player tries to think if there is some sort of pattern to this but can't really see one. After thinking hard about it, the only option is to hit new game and start act 2. This is a very heavy topic, only god knows what will happen when he fails. Honestly, this conversation is so well done, I love the back and forth and the development of Monica. They both know the consequences at what's at stake, and even if this is a sensitive subject, they still try and put that aside and focus on the more important stuff. Even when the MC is being cautious and mentions Act 2 Monica, she quickly understands and lets us know everything. Development! Woo! Apparently, Monica ran away after her confrontation with her parents and didn't have any money so she broke into the school and slept there. Honestly, can't imagine what that was like, must have really sucked. Though in hindsight, that doesn't really make too much sense, but let's not think about that. <laughs> Sayori is the one to really push the idea of taking that first step and saving everyone. I'm really surprised because even through everything, Sayori somehow feels the most rational and willing. Throughout the story, she really ends up being the glue that holds everyone together and really cements herself in this team. It's extremely helpful to have her because all the player can do is just wish that he did things differently and honestly, I really want to blame him, but I can't. If I were in his shoes, I would have done almost exactly the same thing. It's also hard to think properly when you're in constant stressful moments. Though I do agree that he really should have been more honest about him and Meiji from the beginning. There wasn't really a need to hide it for that long, but maybe that's another video for another time. Oh yeah, for some reason the player's backpack and the secret pens got through here. We never really find out how or why, but yeah, we have it. So that's cool, I guess. The team starts planning out and we have a basic idea on what we need to do next, depending on what happens after starting the game of course. What really determines the next step is whether or not the game truly resets and everyone forgets everything. Meiji actually brings up a good point, saying why not skip school in general and yeah honestly why not? <laughs> Once the MC will join the club, Natsuki and Yuri will start acting more weird and their flaws will get amplified so we should definitely avoid this. Though honestly, they're screwed either way, <laughs> because something we'll learn soon is that no matter how hard we try and change the game, it'll always somehow course correct itself. I mean, the signs are already kind of there. MC had gotten sick and couldn't make it to like the first day of the club, but the meeting still happened. The Lidger Club members came to Meiji's house and had it there. And even though we thought we'd save Sayori, her old fate was still clinging on to her. But who knows, maybe something different will happen. The only thing we can really do now is try. The player mentions that finding a way to save the others and keep an eye on them is a top priority. But when he's questioned on not joining the club, he answers that he's scared. I really do love these moments. These are kids, and he isn't the savior OP protagonist that we think he is. He really is just a normal guy. Always has been. After taking a look at the character files, we notice that Yuri's is locked and Monica's libido is... Hi. Gross. Her empathy is also really low, and Monica proceeds to have a small panic attack, but don't worry because this won't be a big deal at all in the story. The team then throw the player outside the window and we hit new game. Monday, October 23rd, 2017. The player wakes up back in Meiji's body, and this scene should be very familiar if you remember the Christmas special. TLDR, woo, Christmas! And then I woke up and everything sucked. <laughs> And I, I will mention though, there is a certain line that happens right before he awakes. A voice calls out to the player, or perhaps is it the player? I'm really not sure, but a voice calls out and it tells us, The world is yours to command, but not this one. It's time to wake up. Even now, I'm not entirely sure what this could mean, but I do have a sort of idea, but we'll get there when we get there. Shortly after the player waking up, Meiji wakes up as well, and thankfully Meiji's memories haven't been erased. It's most likely due to the player's influence, though I could be wrong. Once again, I'll talk about that later. For some reason, Meiji's parents are gone. Don't know why they left, but they did leave a note asking us to take our pills. Meiji then mentions that he is insanely tired and we take one, because you never know, I guess. We leave the room and right before we start investigating, Monica appears at her front door wounded. Much like how in Act 1, she was kicked out, the same happens, only much worse. Instead of a heated argument with Monica's father, instead, her father was seething with rage over Monica leaving the debate club, being far more aggressive than he's ever been. 
Thankfully, Monica wasn't heavily injured, but she's gonna need like, I don't know, at least like three mommy kisses to make it feel better. The player is naturally furious over this, but is able to calm down. This is barely the start and things are already showing just how bad they can get. If you all are wondering why Act 2 is much more awful than Act 1, even though Monica isn't amplifying anyone's negative traits, it's because regardless of what happens now, that's what happens in the base game, and the script is still trying to follow that. Monica asks us what happened when we arrived here, and the player debates on telling Monica about the dream, the Christmas special, but holds off for now, and just tells her the facts. We mentioned the pills, and she said it was reckless for us to take one. This will be important later, I think. We decide to check on Sayori and see if anything changed there, but everything's good. Everyone has breakfast and Sayori gets filled in on the details. During all this, we figure out what everyone's negative traits are for Act 2 that's going to be amplified. That is Meiji's sleeping disorder, where at random times will just clock out, remember that? And the player's anger issues, also, do you remember that? If you remember in Act 1, the player had a tendency to act impulsively sometimes, especially when he was under stress and sometimes he'd go a bit far. I don't mind the seeds being planted now, but it would have been nice to just to see it happen and for it to kind of come out of nowhere. That way the reader can also be caught off guard and everyone's like, oh my god, I can't believe it. <laughs> I don't know, it's a weird balance of like, yeah, the character should be aware of what's going on, but also let's leave some surprises, come on. This doesn't hurt anything, of course, just thought I'd mention it. In reality, I get my wish anyways, because the script sucks. <laughs> While walking to school, the story gives time for Meiji to vent about him learning about his condition. Honestly, kind of surprised about this. In Act 1, Meiji did get some characterization, but it was a bit lacking because there wasn't really much for him to say or sometimes nothing much for him to do, and most of the time we were only worrying about the story and about other characters. So I'm very happy that Meiji gets a chance just to be open with us. His anger is honestly justified. Why didn't his parents ever say anything? Were they hiding it? Or were they absent-minded? That's a good question. I love this kind of stuff and it really gets you thinking. All of that is interrupted when we bump into Sayori's mother, Sayako. We try greeting her, but yeah, we fuck up. Classic player, oh you! We try apologizing the best way possible, I guess? And mention our condition for the, our lack of IQ, and Sayoko loses it even more. Great job, player. She begs us to stop taking our prescribed pills. She clings onto us, saying that she doesn't want to lose us too. This moment is cut short, and we arrive at school. We see yet another familiar face, though. We talk with Mori, and we find out some other small differences between this world and the previous one. One big one being how kind of distant she is from her friend Kaltanoa. And right on cue, here she comes. And there she goes, what a compelling conversation. Reminds me of my Friday nights. Walking through the halls, we see yet another character, Natsuki. Natsuki runs past us, and we continue on. With her being so small, we almost step on her. It's probably smart for us to buy snacks for Natsuki since it's likely that she isn't eating very well. Just gotta figure out how to do it without her punching us. We make our way to the vending machines and find Natsuki BEING A RAT! She was collecting coins under the vending machine and we gladly help her because we're a nice we're such a nice guy. We're, we're a nice guy. This moment will always be kind of funny to me because we randomly show up, ask what she wants, and then just hands it to her and then just leave. No context, no nothing. It's like we're Superman helping the local lolly get her milk. I never expected the MC to be such a chad. It's a very sweet moment and honestly, she deserves it. You can have your milk. The school day progresses and as the player puts it, it's weird how peaceful the day is. If we were in any other situation, this wouldn't be bad at all. In fact, I think a lot of us would enjoy it. But with the knowledge of what is happening with Meiji and the girls and just knowing what this world is like, but at the same time not knowing a damn thing, it's a lot of pressure. I can't imagine knowing what that is like, all while being in a body that doesn't belong to you. We get some lunch and oh look, Yuri! She sits down at her table not knowing we're here and the player strikes up a conversation, but that was a huge mistake. I get that we need to keep an eye on the girls, but that doesn't mean to be friendly to this specific girl. You'll get why in a little bit. Much like how I was saying before, it's oddly calming being able to talk to Yuri. She feels exactly the same as we left her. She lights up when we ask her about her books and shies away when she thinks she's being annoying. Yuri then gets approached by Kotonoa and for some reason she is speaking English? It seems innocent enough, but Yuri is a bit frantic, more than usual. Kotono is asking about her mother, but the whole conversation feels... forced? It's short, but it's interesting to note. I guess this means that Kotono is a bit of a problem and has a hand in a few places. We try and let Monica know, but Kozu seems to notice us, making a slight remark and then walking away. The day's pretty much over and we decide not to take the pills because Sayoko being so against it. Yeah, I guess that was for the best. I wonder what will happen now that we stop taking our pills. Spoiler alert, nothing. In the halls, we see Kosu running away crying and oh god, not her again. So, this is Yai. All my homies hate Yai for real. <laughs> so, let's just ignore that can of worms, we don't need to get into that. But let's just go to the club. Yuri seems way more talkative and confident compared to when we first met her. I really do like how much of a good actor the player is. It's really easy for him just to straight up act like he doesn't know anything, being like, um, am I in the right place? I think I'm just here to fill in a slot. It's cool, because he's like quick on his feet, you know? 
With Natsuki being a bit embarrassed of getting help earlier, he mentions that he bumped into her in the halls, which isn't untrue. Unrelated, I really do like how Yuri carries herself here. It's a nice contrast from our last meeting with her, and not only does it show the difference in personality, it also means that things are changing in the background, and it's not good. <laughs> it's like how I mentioned before with the school being peaceful, but that's only if you close your eyes to everything else around it. Yuri then heads off to go get tea, and Natsuki thanks us for before, only for her stomach to growl. Thankfully, we bought more snacks for her, so let's have some. But, oh god, no! Honestly, understandable. Maybe we were too nice this time? Meiji mentions that maybe her dad might- Okay, let's not- let's, let's stop there, buddy. It's not an unreasonable thing to assume, but that's just dumb to suspect that much at that moment. Let's just eat our snacks and forget about this- Oh hey, Yuri's back! Cool, I really hope she wasn't doing weird things again. With not much to do, we make idle small talk once more, and apparently they were reading the same book that Monica signed from Act 1. Neat, I like how that tied back. We ask about the book, and Yuri gladly tells us about the book and spoils it for us. Gee, thanks Yuri! There's a moment of a conversation between the three of us, but then it cuts with Natsuki really cementing her opinion of not liking the book. I know Natsuki is meant to not like things that require her to think, but wow, she really shuts down Yuri. <laughs> Granted, she's probably just tired of Yuri's fanciness. But the part that really gets me is the, don't say it, I know what you're gonna say, and then just ends there. Like, damn, where'd that tension come from? Natsuki gives us the book and we spend time with Yuri, I guess. Honestly, bad move, you, you know how Act 2 ends, what are you doing? We finish our story and, whoa, that's strange, Yuri's copy is written in English, and without thinking, we almost read it out loud. Honestly, I, I can't, I, I, I can't blame the guy. But, come on, you've been seeing Japanese everywhere. I get that the shift is still kind of hasn't affected you that much because you just somehow are able to read and write in Japanese, but come on dude, that one was an obvious one. That's L number 4 for the MC. Now that reading is over, we return the book back to Natsuki and notice that she's having a bit of trouble with math and okay, never mind. I'm just gonna walk away from that one. She's right, who asked? Ratio. After she yells in frustration, we all decide to help her because apes strong together or something like that. We say our goodbyes and head home. We call Monica and Sayori on the way to check up and for some reason the player stops in front of the house. The music stops and the realization is kicking in. Yes, this is the calm before the storm. A new thing about the MC has also appeared. He tends to bottle stuff in. Honestly, go figure. He's too busy trying to move forward that the moment he stops, it all comes bumbling to the surface. Meiji tries to being supportive and reasonable, and that's when I notice that that's kind of all he ever is, huh? I'll talk more about this later, but it really does feel like Meiji and the player are two strangers very slowly becoming friends, because they have to. It's interesting. Alright, that's enough of that. You can collapse when you get in the space classroom. After taking a nap on Mom- I mean, Mo Mon Monica's lap, Yes. We talk about the day with her. There's a part where the player doesn't really want to tell Sayori about her mom because she doesn't want to do anything reckless, but Monica mentions that we can't hide anything from each other because it just wouldn't be right. Yeah, that makes sense. But at the same time, what is Sayori really going to do? It's right to be cautious, but Sayori is pretty smart. She always thinks things through for the most part. I do like how Monica is the one to want to tell the truth. I like that she's trying to become a good person even though the script is trying to do the opposite for her character. Whoa, it's like that's the theme of the game or something. Oh, it just burped. That hurt. Wanting to clear our minds, we take a walk with Monica and stumble into a church. The player mentions how he used to go when he was little and didn't expect one to be here. After heading inside to get some peace of mind, the player spaces out and imagines his wedding. With a very familiar person with green eyes setting across him, ooh! A woman sits close by and has a coughing fit. And the player goes and offers a handkerchief. Okay. No, 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 wait, hold on. Who carries a handkerchief nowadays? Also, just being fully transparent, I don't know anyone who would do this. I've been to a church before and nobody bothers anyone unless it's before or after. But okay, sure, I can squint and be like, yeah, the MC is a good guy. Sure, why not? Apparently, this woman is not only extremely sick, but is also Yuri's mother. Must run in the family, huh? I'm sorry, that's mean. Not to downplay it, but yeah, Yuri's mother has cancer. <sighs> Once again, further cementing that everything sucks in this world. <laughs> Talking with her, we find out that Miyuki, Yuri's mother, works for Kosunoa's family as an English tutor. That explains why she was asking about her before, but why did she- Yuri shows up and before we can ask any more questions, Monica dips! Wow, gee, thanks, honey! Alright, we say our goodbyes and head home. On the way, Monica realizes that the MC made a huge fuck up by telling Yuri's mom a private conversation that happened with Yuri. A conversation that happened in English, can't believe it. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what the big deal is. Yeah, I guess we messed up, and not only that, Yuri probably knows we lied to her, but that's only if her mom throws us under the bus. Which, I don't think she's the type person to do that. But yeah, I guess we need to keep our distance and be safe around Yuri, but now we look suspicious. But honestly, guys, trust me when I say that it isn't big of a deal. Anyways, we're home and we do another thing that I have mixed feelings on. So after digging, the player realizes that the game script never picks up on his or Meiji's thoughts. Even though in the base game, you can always read the MC's inner thoughts. And after looking around, we find the setting to turn it on. The player makes a very good point that because he has anger issues, we should be careful. But Sayori denies this instantly, not wanting to spy on his private thoughts. Because privacy is important or something like that. 
Because I'm sure Sayori has thoughts that she doesn't want to let the others know, and also, yeah, it just feels wrong to spy on someone's brain like that. But what is it really gonna do? Yeah, I guess it's exposed now, so if he says or does anything dumb, everyone will know about it and we can talk to him about it? Tell him how we- how dare you? How dare you think impure thoughts about Monica? <laughs> Like, honestly, I don't really see a point in this. I appreciate that the player is recognizing that he has anger problems and making preventative measures, but I don't really see what doing this will accomplish. Eventually, Sayori agrees to at least give it some thought because we need any edge we can get, I guess. Well, enough of that. I think it's time we wind down and have some fun, nice, calm moments with these characters. And Melon Soda. I don't know what this mod's obsession is with Melon Soda is, but it's a leg man and Melon Soda, I guess. I think this is now a good time to at least mention the player and Meiji's friendship. For one, I want to applaud the writing for Meiji. I love the back and forth he gets to have with the player. The player is the one who is in control the entire time, and he's also the one we spend the whole game with, so naturally, he gets way more time in the spotlight. But sadly, Meiji is always forced to be in the background, because he literally is. He's floating in our subconscious, but I still very much appreciate how vocal he tends to be. It's so easy just to forget about him, but the player does take time to talk with him and get his opinion on things. Though, if I had to be 100% honest, Meiji as a standalone isn't very good. And I guess that's kind of the point. He's always with someone, whether that's Sayori or the player, but it sucks because he doesn't have that much of a personality. It's there, somewhat, there's always a bit to bite onto, but he's always just replying to others and bouncing off the player. The player makes these dumb jokes and remarks, and occasionally Meiji does poke fun as well, but it's always so overshadowed. He never really makes his own decisions. He does have his moments, but get me more, please. There's layers here, there definitely is, but you need to bring them out, please. Like before when they were discussing like leaving the player's thoughts out in the open, Meiji was literally the last one they asked and it was Sayori who put him on the spot. Yeah, he had something to say in between, but it was just the player and Monica talking while Sayori had her own stance on it. And then Meiji didn't really have a side or motive and just was the mediator. Only to tell the player that yeah, he wanted to side with Sayori, but, but both stances were good to him and he couldn't really do much. See, it's there, it really is, just give me more! I love Meiji, by the way. While having dinner and making fun of the, the player's dumb dad jokes, Sayori asks if we ever think about being a dad. First of all, great transition. That was almost godlike from going from the nice laughing moments to talking about the future. This one, this one question really opens up a whole can of worms as well. It brings up possible romance with maybe a green-eyed beauty, oh if you know what I'm saying! Talking about the future in general while being stuck in this hell reminds us that ah shit, are we ever really going to have moments like these or are we stuck here forever? There's also a weird feeling that I can't really place on my finger. It's weird talking about a possible future knowing that we're in an ethereal classroom that's floating in space, completely ignoring the laws of nature hearing a constant rumbling that doesn't end, all while being able to look out the window and seeing nothing more than a place we used to call home, now being completely fabricated by an all-knowing system that we can't escape. It feels so... suffocating. It's weird because it's such an innocent question, but it, it leaves you feeling incomplete and terrified. Hopefully there is a future out there in the whole vast of space, but it's scary to know what we have to do to earn that future. The player thankfully takes this question and remains optimistic. He admits that he never really thought much about it, but is fully aware that somewhere down the line he'd like to be a father. Not with a big family, just him and his wife and maybe two kids. That hits a bit too close to home, honestly. I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> it's such a sweet moment, everyone talking about being parents and, and the uplifting music, you almost forget the world sucks. Oh yeah, uh, so apparently Sayori and Monica found a way to add rooms in the space classroom. Honestly, that's so cool. I didn't even think of that, but yeah, you have access to the main script and can somewhat edit the files. It doesn't sound too far-fetched that you could just add stuff yourself. We already did by adding a piano and a couch and stuff, why not the whole room? We check out Sayori's room and Monica is like, Oh, you, you know, you should probably sleep separately just in case. You know, you don't want the script being wonky. Player, you should sleep with me. <laughs> Before we go to sleep, Monica pulls a, Uh, guys, you're gonna wanna see this. For some reason, Kozu is outside, just standing out and looking at Sayori's house. And she's crying. It's not long until she sighs to herself and just walks off. Meiji suggests that perhaps she remembers Sayori and just possibly we're not alone in this after all. This could be both a good thing and maybe a bad thing. If she really does remember, I can't imagine how scary that must be to wake up and not know anything, for everything to not only change but for everything to be noticeably darker. Maybe she can have some insight on why she was the only one to retain her memories, and maybe it could help us. But I guess there's not much we can do just yet. Looks like we'll have to confront her tomorrow and find out. Tuesday, October 24th, 2017.
This is probably my favorite part of the mod so far. I don't know why, but once again, this mod just loves making me feel comfy. Right down to the music, the sweet way that Monica and the player wakes up, Sayori asking us how we slept and then talking to Meiji on the couch about getting some tea because of his sore throat. Apparently he was snoring last night and I love that. It's simple, but these exchanges with these characters feel so real and it's just so nice. It also worries me because this mod doesn't keep these moments for very long. When you have such nice moments like this, it makes you scared knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. Monica comes back from her shower and apparently the rain is even harder than it ever has been. Sayori comes out as well with a slight change. I actually really like her hair tied back, it's cute. Though I do miss the bright red hoodie that she had, but hey look, it's, it's she's matching with Meiji now so I guess that's, that's fine. I miss her bow though. Also I just want to point this out because this feels a bit gross, but Meiji said he'd shower but he needs his uniform and of course he needs to merge with the player to go outside of the space classroom to go get his uniform upstairs. So instead of Monica getting his uniform for him, the player just says, ah don't worry I'll get it and I'll shower for you. <laughs> And I don't know why Meiji accept. You think he'd want to wash his own body now that he's finally able to be in control again? But yeah, sure, I guess. Let the man wash you. So the player makes a very smart move to avoid not only the literature club, but mostly Yuri for today, mentioning that he's most likely the catalyst for her possessive and clingy behavior. Which is very true. If the player continues to get close and spend time with Yuri, then it's only natural that she'll go completely bonkers. However, it's not the best idea because as we've seen before in Act 1, the script still sort of finds a way. I mentioned before, but in Act 1 when the MC wasn't able to go to the club because he was sick, the club came to him. I think the best bet is to literally just stay home because I'm positive that even if we go out, we'll still, we'll still somehow bump into Yuri, like how we did at the church. We went for a simple walk and somehow we stumbled into not only Yuri but her mother. And Monica's here now so she can go and check up on the people and report back to us, I think it's fine. There's no real reason to go to school and interact with anyone. We do still need to talk to Kozu, but honestly, just let Monica talk to her. And if she really does remember what happened last week, then bring her over to the house and we can find what we need to. But of course, we still need a story to happen, so we're going to school anyways. Gee, I hope nothing bad happens. So oh, a lot of bad stuff happens. What page are we on so far? <laughs> 15 out of 68. Oh no. Sayori agrees to keep an eye on the script and our inner thoughts, but only if she can decide when she gets to stop. This will not matter, nor will be mentioned ever again. We make our way to school and before class starts, we run into Natsuki at the vending machine. And she assumes that we're stalking her. <laughs> Girl, you need to calm down. We give her our remaining chain so she can buy something and we walk off, like a real Chad. Kozu ends up coming to school late and before we can have a chance to talk to her, she runs off. We follow her and of course, Yae is doing what she does best and that's being a bitch. She shows off pictures of Kozu cosplaying and Kozu runs off crying. I'm a little surprised the MC didn't try and interfere. Then again, he is being a bit cautious, so I guess it makes sense, fine, whatever, but I don't know. Maybe he learned from last time. Lunchtime rolls around and we bump into Yuri, because of course we do. Honestly, kind of funny. We kind of completely walked into that one. MC gets tea for his sore throat. Yuri loves tea and drinks it all the time. It's probably a coincidence, but it sounds like it was all planned out and it's, it's, it's cool. Monica pops into existence and for some reason, the, the player then decides to sit with both of them. Yuri also takes this chance to ask some questions, like why did Monica specifically ask for the MC to join the club? And honestly, props to Monica. She's really good at improvising. Her answer is that she wanted people who liked literature and just so happened to see the MC reading manga and realized that he'd get along with Natsuki and that's why. It's simple and it's effective, good job. Natsuki comes by and then Kotonoa pops in and geez, why is everyone here? It's almost like this is a school cafeteria and students eat here, that's crazy. I think it's about time we mention Kotonoa. She's here. <laughs> uh, wait, hold on. <laughs> She's meant to be this perfect girl who's kind of rolling the school with an iron fist, I think? So the way she talks is meant to be sweet, but also with a bit of that smug I'm better than you attitude. Though that's what the story tells us. Obviously it's a visual novel and it's hard to figure that out because we can't hear her voice, which is why they tell you, but it's kind of a bit of a missed opportunity. If we're going to bother going to school, then I wish we got the chance to see how far her influence truly goes. It's holding onto Yuri very tightly and also a bit for Natsuki. Let's see more of that, come on. The player mentions that it's like playing chess with her because one wrong move and it's checkmate. Well how about we see a little bit of that because so far she doesn't really have too much of a presence. It's alluded to that she might know that Monica is, isn't staying at home, but other than that, I don't see a reason why the situation is tenseful. And honestly, this doesn't come up ever again. Spoiler alert, the fact that she knows that Monica isn't home anymore doesn't fucking matter. I want to know what she's going to do if she finds out. It's not like Yae where she's a bully and actually has a ton of influence. Show me why Kotonoa is kind of a, you know, a, 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 like a villain. <laughs> but I don't know, maybe things will change later. After all, it's barely Tuesday, so a lot can happen. Alright, so... Yeah, this, this, this part could be a bit much, so if you're at all easily disturbed, then please skip to this time. So, the school day finally ends, and we overhear something, and we turn our heads. It's Yai with a strange man. 
and this man is currently putting his hands all over her, and Yae calls this man her uncle. <sighs> yup. The player starts panicking on what we should do, and for some reason he slaps himself. Meiji says that it wasn't him, and they move on. D they decide to put a stop to this situation. The player tries apologizing for this, but Meiji says that Sayori would kill us if we would just walked away. And that's when it kind of clicks. Earlier when he slapped himself, was it Sayori? She should be looking at the script currently, but how would she be able to do that? I mean, clearly it wasn't the player or Meiji who slapped himself, so was it Sayori? I don't know. Well, I guess it's useless to think about it now. It's time to help out Yae. We throw a rock at him, but he doesn't really do much. The man then offers for us to do whatever we want to Yae, completely holding and putting his hands on her against her will. This is honestly disgusting. Even if it is Yae, she doesn't deserve this. No one does. This isn't right. The player's rage starts to take over, but Meiji tries to snap him out of it. But the man takes the opportunity to punch the MC, causing him to go flying. The man then grabs us by the neck and starts squeezing. It's not over yet though. We kick him hard and he stumbles a bit. Even Meiji is starting to get furious and... It's over just as quickly as it started. Yes, we saved Yae, but what came over us? What happened to the world just now? What happened to Meiji? What happened to us? Thankfully the man isn't dead, so at least we didn't completely lose control. The rain is only getting worse, so the player takes Yae to his house. <sighs> wow, there's a lot to unpack here. So yeah, we take her home and ask Sayori if she was the one who slapped us and took control of us earlier, and she just completely dodges the question. Uh, Sayori, I know Yae is here, but this is... Just as, if not more important. Yae regains consciousness and she goes to take a bath and change out of her wet clothes. In the meantime, we ask Sayori to check on Mori's character file at Monica's request. Apparently, Mori decided to check out the literature club, and that's kind of weird. Yae finishes up and she's hungry, so we do what any good husband does when their spouse yells at us. We make them food. <laughs> kind of unrelated, but you know how I mentioned that the scene with Kotonawa and how it was supposed to be kind of tenseful? Well, this scene perfectly captures that feeling just way better. Yai is complying with the situation, but she's clearly not happy about it. She's responding like someone who just threw a tantrum, and the MC is always so close to snapping back at her. He's so cold and constantly reminding himself just to remain calm, because we don't know what she's been through, and we're the ones who decide to help her out after all. It's kind of like a bomb waiting to go off. What if the MC snaps again, and we get a replay of what happened before? What if the world starts breaking because the player gets frustrated at Yai complaining? I love how Yae just glares down at the table and the MC just carelessly passes a cup of water in front of her and it spills a bit. And right when she opens her mouth, the MC just turns his back to her and ignores her. The air is so thick you can cut it with a knife, I love it. We make ramen for Yae and she surprisingly just scarves it down. She finishes it very quickly and then asks us what happened with her uncle, and we tell her everything for the most part. And almost like flipping a switch, Yai grabs the MC's shirt and slams him into the wall, saying that it was personal family stuff and he shouldn't have gotten involved. This only makes the MC's blood boil a bit more, but he tries to keep his composure and stands his ground, saying that he couldn't just stand there and watch. And then... Monica shows up with Mori. And for some reason... Yae decides that this is the perfect opportunity to be her usual self and decides to... She decides to put her hands on us. She touched my no-no spot. <laughs> That's not funny. Monica is naturally furious and this situation honestly could have been saved if Yae just shut up, but no. She keeps going on and on. The MC tries to hold Monica back, but she ends up elbowing him and goes after her. Thankfully, Mori steps in and holds her back and Monica retaliates. I mean, yeah, if Yae wants to talk, then Monica will do the same. And she doesn't hold back, my god. The music then stops and silence fills the room. The only thing that could be heard is the rain outside. Yae seems confused. No, actually, she looks completely taken back at what Monica said. And then...
The MC quickly alerts Sayori to open the door to the space classroom and we rush Yai over to that room. But for some reason, even though he is barely near her, he gets flung backwards. Somehow, they're barely able to get her in the classroom, but the worst of it isn't over. Mori and Yai begin screaming as their bodies distort and glitch, everything around them breaking apart. Monica tries her hardest to fix this in the console, but to no avail. The player tries this himself and then... Silence. But it's not over. Well, I mean, it is, but Monica looks at us and she isn't pleased. She's heartbroken over what Yai said. She goes off on us, but... Sayori for the rescue! Yay! Thank you for that. I, I owe you a cookie, Sayori. I'm really happy Sayori's here, because, wow, all of that is just... I can't imagine. I'm already so emotionally drained from reading through this again, I can't imagine what the player would actually be going through right now. Also, damn, I've never seen Sayori act like that before. She has her moments of being mad, but that was something else. All Monica could do was run away and lock herself in the room. Honestly, same. The player looks around almost like he's lost, but Sayori snaps him out of it and tells him to go after her, to go fix things with Monica. <sighs> oh boy, I need a break. I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to take the second to just say thank you. Thank you so much for watching up to this point. We're almost halfway through the mod. Yes, almost halfway. <laughs> things are only going to get more crazy. And if you're at all enjoying this, then why not like the video and maybe subscribe? It'd mean a lot. And please let me know what you all think in the comments below. Alright, grab a snack and a glass of water. We're back in. <sighs> Alright, let's go. The player knocks on the door and asks Monica if she could open it, and thankfully, she unlocks it. We enter the room and, yeah, she's a mess. She's completely sobbing, and this is where you kind of lose me a bit. Alright, here we go. So the player decides that now is the time to speak from the heart, and before Monica could apologize about using the word love, yes, you heard me correctly, instead of apologizing for believing the dumb words that Yai said, and elbowing us in the stomach and just going completely bockers on us, no, instead she apologizes for saying that, and I quote, I loved you. That's what she's apologizing for, the I love you part. <laughs> I mean, okay, I get it. I don't want to, I don't want to, but I, I think I get it. The player is the only thing in her life right now. He's the most important thing to her. Of course she's freaking out about this, especially after trying to redeem herself from what could ha what could have happened. But, okay, let's just continue. The player puts his hand on Monica and confesses. She looks at him in complete shock, and he says it. He's been in love with her for a long time now, and he's sorry that all this has happened. He then mentions his dream. Before the world restarted, he dreamed of a possible future, a world where everyone was happy. And there sat him and Monica, alone on a hill looking at the city on Christmas Eve, finally having that moment they longed for, finally sharing that kiss they both dreamed of. Monica then quickly leans in and... Okay, fine, this is cute. <laughs> the more I read, the more I actually love this moment. It's a payoff that everyone has been waiting for for so long, but the road to get here... I don't want to talk about it. Okay, let me start with this. This is so convoluted. I get the idea, believe me. There is a setup. God, I just hate everything that led up to this moment. A part of me wants to applaud the writing team because after dealing with a stressful scene, this moment feels so nice. It feels like everything is finally off our shoulders. It's kind of insane how like the easiness I felt with reading this for the first time. It felt like I was holding in my breath for the longest time, and then finally when they kissed, I just exhaled. Because at this moment, I finally knew that this was over. I do think it was a great decision to put this specific moment here. But let me walk you through all this. So today, we went to school, we missed Kozu even though she was the whole reason why we went, and then while walking home we saw Yai getting a bit too tangled up in family affairs, and we save her and almost break the world trying to do it. And then we take Yai into our home and give her shelter from the rain only for Monica to come home and fight Yai cause why not? And then the world decides this to break another time, so we bring them into the space classroom, and then Monica decides that now that that's over with, she's gonna yell at us for being with another woman. We then confess to Monica and finally kiss her. All that happens in the span of 30 minutes. I will admit that everything actually flowed really nicely, but damn, that was way too much. And I know that this mod has a lot of slow sections, so it makes sense that we have a whole climax eventually, but I can't believe we chose now to have Monica and the player confess to each other and have their first kiss. So much stuff got thrown at the wall. I honestly wish that first we deal with all of this, and then finally when things are all over, we can finally have this scene. This scene is important not only to the characters, but to the story. This is Monica's whole arc. She's been wanting nothing more than this moment for the player to call her his and or mine or whatever. Monica has been trying to be a better person and not like her original counterpart. And what is keeping her moving forward is the player. This part needed just a bit more care and focus. Cause no joke, this part only lasts like seven minutes and then we move on. I'm not even joking. 
After all that teasing and flirting and Monica being so head over heels, this moment is reduced to just barely 7 minutes. That's insane. This moment being jammed in here feels so crazy. This should have been the reward after dealing with all that chaos from the previous scene. Have Monica and the player be awkward around each other. Let them deal with Yai and Mori and then after all that's over and it's finally nighttime and it's time for them to go to bed together, they then have this talk. I can appreciate them talking it out so there's no drama and we could properly focus on the story and what happened to Yai and Mori, but if that was a problem, why did we put this scene here? You should have just waited a little bit longer. Overall though, this moment is actually written so well. <laughs> I know I was just shitting on it, but my god, this moment is actually very cute. And it still makes me happy because, oh my god, Jesus Christ, why did this take so long? After being in the moment for barely a minute, they realize, oh shit, people are dying in the other room, and Monica and the player go out and survey the situation. Yai and Mori are in a stable condition, but are unconscious. We look over at the character files, and I'm not sure what this means, but Natsuki Yuri is labeled as CHR, you know, for character. But for some reason, everyone else is changed to CHRX. There's also this weird file called worldpop.xlt and it requires a password. I, I gotta ask, are these real file names? What, what do they mean? I, I'm honestly very confused. After searching a bit more, we find out that there's actually a memory setting and now they're set to true. Both of them labeled alpha and beta, which I assume are both act 1 and act 2 memories respectfully. Respect- whatever. We also find out that apparently the player tried making his own DDLC mod, which I don't think was ever brought up. Correct me if I'm wrong because honestly this is kind of crazy. He even says that he played Relapse, Salvation, Relapse? Good Ending, and Welcome to the Literature Club. God, like, dude, what the heck? Good taste, honestly. Oh shit, there's more. Oh, oh hey, he played Monica After Story. That's really cool. I wonder how it feels to go from playing Monica After Story to now actually dating Monica. That's whack. It feels a bit weird talking about this now, though. But yeah, sure, let's just keep talking about DDLC mods to Monica. Yeah, why not? I'm sure she wants to know all about the lewd mods out there don't check my computer <laughs> monica checks her file and she deletes a thing that was blocking her memories and in a flash she remembers everything from act two her whole life that she had lived in this world is now accessible she now has two sets of memories one from act one and another from act two and funny enough monica says they're pretty similar with just a few changes mostly leading to the way that the club started kozu yai and mori and natsuki and yuri were pretty much the same but kotonoa had the most differences as it was mentioned before, she has way more influence and reputation in the school and even rumors that her family is possible Yakuza. Out of curiosity, we check Yuri and Natsuki's character file. A message then pops up saying that conditions have not been met yet. That's not ominous. It looks like if we want to make any changes, we're going to have to find a way to trigger them to remember somehow. Another creepy thing is that the player also has some memories that are locked currently. So not even he is safe. I hate it here. It's not like the one from the Christmas special or the other from Act 1 because he remembers everything already and it can't be memories from his normal life because yeah, he knows exactly what happened and what went down. So what does this mean? We get some one-on-one bro time and I appreciate that they're addressing that. Yeah, that, th that was whack. Maybe the player shouldn't have confessed to Monica when other things went on. And of course, Meiji is like, bro, that's sick. Good job. <laughs> we quickly cut to a more depressing note. So Sayori doesn't have any beta memories. Go figure, she isn't supposed to exist in Act 2. But... What if there was more to the story? It is a bit weird how Sayori's mother acted towards us, and after a bit of digging, turns out that yeah, Sayori did actually exist but passed away pretty early on. The conversation switches to the idea of giving Yai and Mori their Act 1 memories, and here we learn that Sayori did not mess with our file and slap us. Cool. So what the heck happened back there? I kind of hate how we moved on from that, but yeah, I guess it isn't important, though it does feel kind of important. Is there a higher being who did it? What if- no, now hear me out. Since the player has two sets of memories, what if this is an Attack on Titan situation where- You know how Eren did a bunch of time stuff and when he kissed Astoria's hand he remembered everything? What if it's basically that? I'm just saying, this feels important. Meiji goes ahead and decides to remember everything and I guess it isn't important because we just move on with Sayori saying that she's the reason why Yai turned out like this. Honestly, that's kind of lame. I feel like we could have found out about Meiji's childhood and maybe like why he has this like weird sleeping condition and why he's taking the pills and what his doctor said to him and why exactly this medication is so like terrifying. You know, any sort of information about like his parents or anything. That definitely feels very important. I don't know why we skipped over that. Like, spoiler alert, Meiji remembering his past, it doesn't come up ever again. I mean, it's cool that he remembers, but like, he never bothers to use his information, he never like brings it up again, it's just, you know, it's gone now. So apparently Yai wasn't always that kind of person, and was actually pretty reserved and quiet. And one day, Sayori saw that she was alone and sat next to her. Turns out, Yai was getting bullied for having a long neck and a mature figure, so she was pretty self-conscious and afraid to speak to anyone. And then Sayori says that she doesn't know what ended the friendship, only that she started to change around the second year of school. Okay, so 
If that's the case, then why did Sayori say that it was her fault? No, honestly, I'm, I'm actually confused. If she's trying to say that if she didn't be friends with her, then she wouldn't have become a bully, I don't really get that part. Anyways, we make Mori and Yai remember who they used to be. You get your memories back, and you get your memories! Everyone gets their memories back! Oh boy, and this part's pretty disturbing. Yai tries scratching her face while saying things that I don't want to mention or think about, and Mori grabs a pen and tries hurting herself, all while saying, delete. No, that's not what we want. Don't stop, we deserve it. No, stop it. Get out of my head. It's ours. It's our destiny. Get out of my head. Hold us back. We'll hurt someone. Where's our happy ending? I'm a brutal, I don't know how to respond. I kind of have a theory, I think, but it's only going to make sense later when we talk to Kozu, so yeah, I guess look forward to that. Yai and Mori both wake up, and yeah, Yai is blaming Sayori for some reason, and the player comes in blazing hot and just slaps her. G get out of here. While trying to explain everything, Yai just keeps talking, and at this point, the player is beyond frustrated with her, and just shows her proof by combining with Meiji. Yai then completely like quiets down and the player continues to explain their situation. Mori actually takes it well for the most part, only being a bit reluctant and nervous about all this, but but she actually ends up agreeing to help out. Yai tries to get in a word but looks over at the player and stops herself. Yai then puts the pieces together and realizes that we were the ones that yelled at her before in Act 1, not Meiji. She then asks us if she can use the bath, but the player wanting to be difficult says, Sorry, not my house, you gotta ask Meiji. The player then drags Yai over to Meiji and makes her ask him nicely. It's very awkward and kind of funny, I, I actually like it. Especially when the player is the one that's like, Ugh, she's so rude, like dude, come on, you're the one who started this. The MC then goes around the house to find some medication because Meiji isn't doing so well and then Yai asks for us. She wonders what happened to her family member and if you'll be alright, but before she could say more, the MC tries to be there for her, saying that she can stay here for tonight and that she shouldn't think about him. This scene is actually really well done. It's a bit of an odd one because we just spent the last 30 minutes hating and resenting Yai, but now in this moment, she's so small. It makes you wonder if she has anyone to confide in. I wonder just how alone she must feel to start talking to the guy who was giving her a lot of shit before and, and even threatened to beat her up if she kept talking. It's weird, but I bet she feels a bit close to the player because of what he witnessed and because he saved her. I also love how the MC mentioned Sayori in the conversation, saying that she would be happy to have her here, you know, further giving her reassurance that she should stay here and that it's not wrong for her to feel this way. And immediately, Yae starts breaking down. He really didn't have to do any of this, but I'm really glad that he did. Yae really has been through a lot, and I'm sure she needs a bit of support and a lot of guidance. It's kind of strangely human how she went from being kind of on top of the world and now she's lowering her walls because everything just came crumbling down. She didn't have to talk to the MC, but she still chose to, even after all that happened. Clearly there's a bit of depth here that maybe needs to be explored. Of course, I still don't forgive her. I'm not sure if anyone does, but this is a very nice start for us to see who Yai is, who she truly is beyond all those layers. I'm also glad that she doesn't resent Sayori after all that she said already. Now that everything is, for the most part, worked out, the MC decides to take a walk to clear his head. We eventually walk into a store and, oh look, it's Yuri's mother. <laughs> what a coincidence! We talk for a bit, it doesn't last long due to her having a slight coughing fit, so we help her get to the back of the store, that way she can take a little bit of a rest. The player then calls Monica to let her and Sayori know what's going on, and yeah, we're, we're kind of in a pickle here. <laughs> we can't really leave Yuri's mother here alone. I mean, we can, but that's kind of a dick move. Monica says she can give us Yuri's number so we can call her to pick her up, but then Yuri would have our number, which is kind of a no-no. Also, yeah, I guess that would be a suspicious since Monica and Meiji aren't really supposed to be friends per se, so why would she have his number? And there really isn't much we can do, sadly. I'd say just play it safe and call Monica over so she can drop her off instead, but actually, I, I, wait, actually, that's a good idea. About half an hour goes by and she wakes up from her nap and we help her to her house. Out of nowhere, she starts talking in English and oh god, no, we've been caught. And now she's asking about Yuri. Okay, that's fine. We can still be safe. Oh shit. So, yeah. <laughs> Looks like things are gonna start getting worse. It seems like Yuri is starting to catch some feels for us. That's not good or bad, maybe? I don't know. Yuri's mother then opens up to us, saying that she's extremely worried for Yuri and she doesn't know what'll happen to her when she's gone. We also learn that her father passed away when she was young, so if the worst truly does happen, she'll truly be alone. This really makes you think, is it really right to avoid Yuri? Maybe she isn't so bad. Maybe we've been misunderstanding her this entire time, I mean, she seems normal so far from what we've seen. And honestly, I think she needs a friend more than ever now that we've learned this. 
Her mother further pushes us by asking us to look after Yuri when she's gone. That she's never been happier and she wants her to continue to be happy. Almost on cue, she gets a phone call from Yuri. Turns out she was watching us from the window and quickly hurries to help her mom. She asks us if we can come inside so she can thank us for helping, and honestly, I'm a bit conflicted. I'm not fully convinced, because we've seen what happened to Sayori at the end of Act 1, but I do admit that I do feel really bad. But overall, we should be prioritizing everyone's safety and just go home. Make up an excuse like, oh, it's late, or oh, the storm's gonna get worse, so yeah, we should head home. But like, I don't know. I don't know, I wouldn't personally stay, we did enough and now it's time to head home, right? But I also don't want Yuri to... I don't know, it's confusing. The MC accepts and enters the apartment and we wait around a little bit. Yuri then thanks us and opens up a little and... Okay, now I'm really starting to feel bad. It's very clear that Yuri is always on alert because of her mother, <laughs> because her mother is always kind of a handful, and even she knows that she isn't going to be around much longer. She very quickly starts crying. She tells us that she's scared. She doesn't want to lose her mother. Just a second ago, she was trying to keep a hold on herself, but now she straight up says she's terrified. <sighs> wow. It's, it's kind of weird because the entire game we've been so cautious of Yuri and so afraid of her, but she's just normal. It's so weird how there's a bit of a mind games going on because we haven't seen Yuri be anything more than just a normal person. Her mother hands us a thermos of soup and the MC finally leaves. We make it home and apparently now's a chance for us to clear the misunderstanding that happened earlier in the kitchen with Yai, I guess. And thankfully everything is good. It's been one heck of a day. Let's hope tomorrow can be better. Wednesday, October 25th, 2017. So the plan for today is to confront Kozu and figure out what is happening with her, and for Mori to keep an eye on the literature club. The lit literature club. <laughs> Yai, however. <laughs> oh, there she is. Still kind of cold towards us, but hey, progress. Everyone has breakfast and there's a lot of tension. <laughs> Naturally so. I kind of like having Yai here, personally. I feel like she kind of fits in a bit better than I thought. It's also great to have Meiji actually say something and be able to talk to Yai and get more involved, even if it wasn't in the best way. <laughs> the gang gets ready for school, and the player realizes that he's been insanely hard on Yai, and he really needs to start chilling the fuck out. And for once, he looks at her. Not as a monster or a bully, no. He looks at her as just a normal girl. A lonely person who has been suffering. Yai looks back confused and terrified. Normally when the player looks at her, it's with disdain. And that's what she's expecting. But the player tries to prove her wrong. He takes a step towards her. She's about to scream and go into a panic, but the player talks to her. Actually talks to her this time. With no malice or attitude or anything. He tells her that she will be safe. She'll be safe with him. Yai immediately wants to deny and argue, but the more they look at each other, the more those emotions start to fade. The more Yai wants to confide in someone. Until finally, she breaks down. She wanted her walls up, but that's so hard to do when someone swears to protect you, huh? She eventually stops and tries to put some distance between her and the MC, but hey, that was actually some really good progress. We stop by the vending machines and we once again encounter Natsuki. It's kind of funny how we keep meeting up like this. We help her get some of the spare coins like we did before, but for some reason she's extremely mad at us today. We buy her a drink regardless and she tells us she isn't going to be a part of our harem and runs off. Now, I'm not gonna say this is unrealistic, but what kind of rumor spread that quickly? It's been like 10 minutes, and already a, like a good portion of the school know about it. Believe it or not, I've been to school, and these kind of rumors take at least a whole day, sometimes even two days to like fully spread. Then again, my school never had like a school idol or like the prettiest girl in the school type of thing, so maybe it really did spread like wildfire because yeah, Monica is so popular, and of course we have Yai, the, you know. <laughs> But I'm surprised Natsuki believed it. I thought she would know Monica better than that. Also, I thought she would trust us because we've been so nice to her, but I, I guess it makes sense. Even Mori is getting angry at us because now she's tied to it because she approached us and walked with us. I would say that this is the player's fault, but at this point, I think keeping up public appearances was the last thing on his mind. Though, yeah, I don't know why he stayed outside after realizing they all came out in the same house. I guess he was a little preoccupied, but you know what? It's, it's fine. It's not a big deal. But wow, Mori snapped at us. That's not like her. It's kind of cool, actually. So after ditching class and looking around for a long time, we finally run into Kosu, and she's not happy. She heard about the rumors, and she's completely furious. Especially about the part of us paying everyone off to forget about Sayori. Wait, what? Wait, how does she know about Sayori? The MC tries to speak, but as usual, we could never talk out of these misunderstandings. So the MC decides to just cut all the bullshit and brings her over to a secluded spot and opens up the space classroom. And Sayori and Monica begin telling her everything. 
Meiji then starts to wonder why only Kozu was able to remember after the world resets, and the player mentions that her character file was, is completely unique. Okay, so here's what I think. Remember when I was talking about Mori's memories? About how what happened when she regained them and the weird things she was saying? Here's my theory. So, obviously Mori is kind of a reskin of Sayori. She has the exact same face, and her hair is kind of the same as well, other than a few extensions that she has. She, she even has a bow on her, like Sayori. So what if the reason why Mori was saying stuff like delete, no stop it, get out of my head, hold us back, will hurt someone, where's our happy ending, is because in that moment when she was glitching and convulsing, her base code of Sayori was kicking in, which is why she was trying to argue with herself. And possibly the same could be said about Kozu. If you've been around and read through a bunch of DDLC mods, then you'd know that Kozu was actually supposed to be the female MC. So maybe the reason why Kozu remembers was because her code of being an MC was interfering and gave her special treatments? I mean, yeah, think about it. The only one who remembers was obviously Meiji and the player because they literally are the MC. And the girl whose character is a gender swap version of the MC now remembers everything. This is of course just speculation, but I think the game is getting a bit deeper with how they're using these characters. I'm not sure if these will ever come up again in the story, but I feel like this could be important. I mean, I mean, especially with Mori, like why was she arguing with herself two different voices? And why was she saying get out of my head? Especially since the story bothered to get them involved now, because in Act 1 these were just side characters, but now they're joining the roster and becoming part of the main cast. So this has to be important. But that's just a theory! A GAME THEORY! I, I miss him already. Kozu ends up believing us, honestly thank god. Kozu ends up telling us exactly what happened before the reset. Apparently she had stayed up all night and when the day came around, she went to Sayori's house to walk her to school, and only for the world to start falling apart, forcefully breaking at the seams. She ended up running only to feel like she was hurt. She fell to the ground out of nowhere, unable to move, and then everything just stopped. She was back in her room and the week had restarted. Things get a little heated with Kozu attacking Yai, and then Mori yelling back at Kozu, it's just a lot. You know, maybe it wasn't the best idea to try to team up with them. <laughs> After about 20 minutes, Kozu and Yai finish their heavy discussion, and Mori pushes Yai into Sayori's arms and they hug. Then Mori hugs Kozu. Aw, oh, cute, I think. Do I sound tired? I'm a little tired. So, what do we do now? Honestly, I'm kinda lost. The Meiji and the players still want to go to school, and I don't see why. I mean, we now have an army of girls at our disposal, and we can now just chill while everyone can keep an eye on things. Yai and her bullies can keep track of stuff, and Morty and Kozu can join the club and make sure Yuri doesn't end up alone and dead. I honestly don't know what else to do at this point. We're just trying to avoid Yuri and Natsuki dying, so maybe we should have them remember things before things get out of hand? I maybe? I feel like it'll be easier if they remember Sayori and we keep them in the space classroom. It seems like the space classroom is able to defy even the game's logic, so why not just keep them there forever? They'll be safe just like Sayori has been, and we can try and change their character files with their consent. I know that can probably be a bit complicated because of Yuri's mom, but we just have to wait this week out, right? We just have to survive everything that this week has in store for us. Plus at this point, they are kind of the only ones who don't know anymore. Well, other than Kotonoa, but she isn't really relevant. Yai and Kosu go back to having another conversation, and Sayori tells us that she's getting real tired of just looking at code on the screen. So to cheer up our little bun, we decide to give her some anime and manga to look at. Honestly, I completely forgot about Sayori being depressed. It's nice that they address it, and yeah, she's just she's bored, I get that. Sayori literally has nothing to do, so I'm glad that she has some downtime. Lunchtime! Yuri finds us and asks us if we're sick. Yeah, honestly, haven't been feeling too good, but I hopefully by tomorrow a little- Shit, she spoke in English. <sighs> I'm getting real tired of these girls tricking me like this. How does this keep happening? <laughs> the first time was like, okay, sure, whatever. The second time was like, okay, maybe that was my B. It slipped my mind. And then this time, bro, the fuck? I'm starting to develop trust issues. This ain't right. And Yuri has the fucking audacity to be like, why did you lie to me? Yuri, you realize you lie to us all the freaking time. <laughs> Not to mention, you're a stranger. Don't pull that, oh, why did you lie to me? Like, bro, I barely know you. I don't care if I helped your mom. At least she was able to understand why I was keeping a secret. Which brings me to my next point. Why are we keeping secrets? What's the point anymore? Yuri then goes on and on about, oh, you had women over your house. Yeah, so what, Yuri? I'd be pulling mad bitches for real. <laughs> for, for real, though, I, I don't know why Yuri is getting so mad at us. I guess to play devil's advocate, maybe she feel like she doesn't know us anymore, I guess? The last time we did see her was like yesterday and she vented to us and like we were there for her. So I guess it makes sense why it's like, who the fuck are you? Like, what is, ro what is wrong with you? But at the same time, you barely know us. <laughs> Like, we betrayed ourselves as a good guy, and then all of a sudden she finds out we'd be keeping secrets and we had two girls over our house. 
honestly, I'm surprised her first instinct wasn't to try and figure things out because yes, Yuri is a lot smarter than people give her credit for. I at least would think that maybe she would not listen to silly rumors and be like, what's that guy? I know him. He's not, he's, he's a good guy. What are you talking about? I feel like Yuri would at least give us the benefit of the doubt, but I don't know, with this is act two. Maybe she's more possessive and clingy, I don't know. Honest to god, you don't need to explain yourself to Yuri. If I were in this position, I'd say it was a misunderstanding, use whatever excuse I had, and as soon as Yuri questions me, I'd walk away and be like, believe what you want. This is not only a Chad move, <laughs> this also helps Yuri not like us anymore, because yeah, what's wrong with us? <laughs> also, there's no point in trying to explain anything to her, especially when she doesn't have her memories of Act 1. So just walk away and maintain distance and let Monica handle it. She's better at lying than us anyways. But yeah, of course she doesn't believe us because how oh, dare you, a good healthy boy, now put the moves on two attractive women and- Okay, hold on, calm down, Yuri. Uh-huh, yeah, stress, totally, yeah, let's walk away from this, please. I don't see a reason in us being here. She then changes the subject and asks us if we give it any thought of joining the club, to which the MC replies, not really, and even less now. I can't believe it, bro really just said no. <laughs> ah shit, Kotono is here now, great! Oh great, now she knows we spoke English. Fucking beautiful! She tries to hire us as an English tutor and we decline. Yuri then runs off and we see Monica and Mori and... <laughs> well, that's a way to spice up your Wednesday morning. So, the world glitches out and Monica specifically says, You can't save us all. Why don't you die already? The MC then wakes up in the nurse's office and- what? I'm not normally a simp, but I can change. Speaking of change, wow, the rain stopped. That's cool. The MC dashes into the literature club to get away from all the people staring and talking about it. We try and talk to Monica, but of course Yuri and Natsuki have to ruin everything. This is a bad idea. And once again, instead of leaving, the MC decides that he needs to clear up the misunderstanding and talk it out. Dude, kinda not the time. Mori to the rescue! Honestly, I'm so happy she's here. Her version of the story is that her and Monica were walking home and talking about club stuff, then she saw that Yai was trying to do some shady stuff outside her house, so they stepped in and helped out. And oh boy, it was a crazy night of arguing. And since it started raining outside, they had to stay the night. And for some reason, both Natsuki and Yuri just believe it. And even Yuri goes, MC-kun, why didn't you tell me? Bro, shut up, because you didn't fucking let me. You came at me super hostile, and when I tried giving you an answer, you were like, that's super hard to believe that a boy your age would not do anything with two attractive girls. Like, bro, it didn't matter what the MC told you. You were not going to believe me anyways. And if you're going to say, oh, it's because Mori's story is super sound and reliable. No, it fucking isn't. Are you telling me that they just happened to keep arguing until the middle of the night, and then they stayed because of the rain? Maybe be Monaco, but not Yai or Mori. It's so much more believable to say that, oh, the MC helped out Monaco for studies and that's why they're friends, and Yai wanted a piece of that action and things got heated and they stayed because it was late in the rain. It's pretty much the same thing, just told by a different person. I'm not salty, you're salty. <laughs> Especially since this gives a reason on why Monica would be friends with a basic guy like MC. It's cause he's smart and knows English, and smart people like to stick together. Instead of a, oh no, they argue and then they got late and they stayed the night. No, just, that doesn't, no, I hate that idea. I hate that. Monica offers us to relax in the back of the club and MC does just that. Meiji then points out, huh, that's kind of funny how we tried avoiding this place, but we still ended up here. Okay, cool, let's walk out. <laughs> like, bro, for real, you could just walk out, you know. You're not tied to the chair, you have working legs, just go home. Or maybe just go back to where you had open the space classroom and take a shortcut, I don't know. Don't sit here and be like, oh, the script is so powerful, bro, just walk away, for real. <laughs> After a bit of time, the MC talks with Natsuki, and thankfully, they bond real quick. Who knew anime nerds were so outgoing? This is also a very nice break from all the- I'm not even gonna lie, that actually got me. Jesus Christ, my heart hurts. That actually scared the shit out of me. Natsuki then mentions her dad and how she's a faceless nobody. Kind of a stretch, but sure. Then Yuri acts like she's the final boss and starts laughing and... Oh shit. For some reason, the MC can't move and Meiji isn't responding. And my god, the moment Monica tries anything, Ma Natsuki just bitch slaps her away. Even Mori tries pulling them apart, but they just keep going. We just had to show up to the club! Meiji then starts reciting lines from the original game, and almost like a puppet, the MC's arm starts going up to try to point at one of the girls. The game is forcing him to make a choice and to choose one. The player uses his free arm to try to force the other one down. He desperately tries to regain control to the point that blood starts pouring out of his nose. 
Everyone in the room just looks at him and then he collapsed on the floor, completely exhausted and gasping for air. Well, on the bright side, at least they stopped arguing. You gotta be kidding me. Um, Earth to anyone. I'm currently dying. Natsuki and Yuri run off and we tell Monica and Mori to go after them. Sayori then opens the space classroom and she just sees us chilling on the floor, which is honestly kind of funny to imagine. The whole room is a mess and then you just got MZ planted face down talking to himself. We tell Sayori what happened and then we make our way to find the girls. We see Yai on our way and she tells us that Yuri is in the bathroom and Natsuki is outside so we make our way to Yuri first. And yeah, she's uh, doing what she does best. The MC tries being calm with her, but she almost slashes at us for using her first name. Then she runs off. The player then starts freaking out because everything sucks, and Meiji asks if we're okay. And the player completely snaps at him, causing them to merge for a split second. Everything is gray. Everything stops. The player can't move, can't even hear his or Meiji's thoughts. He's stuck. He can't do anything. Everything then turns black and... We're brought back to the space classroom. Back in our own body. Back in control. But... Are we really? We turn and see Sayori, holding her throat and gasping for air. We rush to Sayori and she manages to get a hold of herself. We turn the other way and Meiji is lying on the floor just staring at the ceiling. Not moving, not responding, completely lifeless. Sayori yells at us, calling us idiots for arguing and hurting Meiji. She then starts sobbing on the floor. Everything is going wrong. But it isn't over yet. Meiji eventually snaps out of it and Sayori clings to him. Meiji even brings us into the hug and pokes a bit of fun. Yeah, everything is still okay. So, apparently the world was going crazy and was great because of Sayori. They don't exactly say anything specific, but basically I think Sayori stopped the script and paused time or something, and then dragged us into the space classroom herself. Which is why she was coughing because yeah, she's supposed to be... yeah, you know what I mean. Apparently she was too busy watching anime, which is why she took a little too long, which I find hilarious. Sayori, you saw the MC laying flat on the ground in a destroyed classroom, and you chose now to continue One Piece? The player and Meiji exit the space classroom and continue to find the girls, and look, it's raining again! Hooray! We look around like crazy and we find Monica and add her to our party, then we find Natsuki and- I want to go back to playing with Legos. So, there's a lot to unpack here. The player has gotten completely unstable and somehow he was able to summon the console. And in his fit of rage, he hurt Monica. Wow, remember when they spent their first night together and he promised he wouldn't do that? Wow, that's crazy. It's almost like that's foreshadowing. In all honesty, this is such a perfect arc for the player. I thought what was going to happen was that he was going to get more and more messed up because he was trying so hard to save everyone and he can't. So he was going to pull like an exit music redux, but no, instead, color me surprise. They went an even better route. I was wondering this entire time why we never mentioned Monica's empathy stats, but that's because it was a complete red herring. It was a diversion! The true villain was us after all! That's crazy! It makes so much sense, but yeah, the story happens because of us, the player, not because of Monica. If the player didn't exist, then technically none of this would ever exist either. That's so obvious, I love it. This was all leading to this very moment. We tried so hard to save everyone, but look at us now, causing most, if not all, the problems. Man, this is depressing. Natsuki then looks at us completely starstruck that anyone would ever stand up for her. Then Mori says that we don't have time for this. Come on, let me have something! I like to think that that moment that Natsuki tried sharing with us actually meant something. Even if we are the villain right now, there's a chance that we could end up doing something good. There's a chance that at least something will work out, because Natsuki was terrified but still reluctant to thank us for helping her. Which, if I know Natsuki, she would just call us a dummy and say that we made things worse for her. But the fact that she was thankful for what we did means that it must have been really bad, but at least we did something really good. So maybe there's still hope? Maybe, even if we are the villain right now, there's always a chance we can put back the hero cape or something. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just, I'm tired and scared. <laughs> With the MC runs out in the rain without grabbing his umbrella or getting his bag, he just runs. Panic setting in. We messed up. And not only that, through our actions, we were able to open the console. This is really bad, but none of that matters right now. 
What matters is Monica. We heard her, and we need to find her. We run up the stairs and stumble into the space classroom, and Sayori's on the floor, telling us that Monica grabbed a rope in a chair and locked herself in her room. We kick down the door and Monica stares at us, holding the rope in her hands with tears rolling down her cheeks. We made it in time. The player tries talking sense, but Monica doesn't listen. The player just keeps talking and trying to reach out to Monica, and eventually she finally drops the rope and stumbles into the player. Monica yells out that she's the antagonist and she doesn't deserve us. The player then lashes out, saying that he's at fault here. He doesn't even belong here, but Monica does. Monica pleads for us not to say anything like that anymore. She needs us. She feels lost without us. And before we can get another word out, she kisses us. Monica quickly shoves her lips into the players and holds onto us with everything she's got. The player gladly gives in and kisses back with the same amount of desperation. Monica then slowly pushes the player down towards the bed. Monica sits on the player's lap and looks down, slowly removing... Okay, let's not... <laughs> The player immediately snaps out of his daze, and before Monica can do anything, he gets her off of him. <laughs> this isn't right. This isn't love. This isn't a moment. This is fear. This is desperation. This is not wanting to lose the person you love. This is not special. This is not love. Monica snaps back, wanting nothing more than trust, feeling rejected. I'm not sure how I feel about this. On one hand, this is such a great scene. I feel like this is such a perfect way to show off just how scared and desperate Monica truly is. She wants to be seen and not tossed to the side. She so badly wants to be better. She wants love. It's always been about that, but the buildup for the scene is almost non-existent. The way to get here was kind of a hassle. Having Monica try and take her life only to fall in the MC's arms and try to make love to him is great, but there isn't too much backing that up. I understand that Monica has a fragile mind, but she's been getting way better. This is also just a repeat of what happened before when they confess. A ton of unrelated things until finally they got involved, and then Monica gets mad at him, and then they make up. This is supposed to be a beautiful tragedy. We hurt Monica, she ran off, and now she's having a panic attack, feeling so alone. You could argue that even though they confess and are feeling so close in support of each other, and even though Monica now has to play her to herself and has what she wants, it's not so easy to break out of your depression, to break free from your worries and your inner thoughts telling you all the bad things. I know you can't get better overnight, but we don't see that. Monica doesn't tell us any of that. There's no signs that Monica is dealing with these emotions. Yes, we do get hints that she's always feeling pressured and she's always panicking about what she could become, and this is something we desperately need more of. There's signs of more, but it's never fully expanded upon. I want her to tell us how alone she's feeling. Even though we're close to each other, she wants nothing more than to be closer. I want her to tell her that yes, even though we are together now and that the MC's eyes is only for her, I want her to still say that she's still worried. I want her to open up more. I want to know why she feels so alone and how we can help her. I want this moment to last longer. There's no lingering tension or consequences. What's supposed to be a beautiful moment of them promising to be each other's support system and doing things because they love each other, not because of circumstance, ends up only being another Monica moment so we can check it off the list. It's so easy for Monica to get back to her senses that I wish that she would tell us all of her worries in this moment. If she did, that would make this moment feel earned and perfect. Sayori and Meiji then pop in and we have a big ol' hug. How nice. Then Yai pokes her head in and apparently she brought Natsuki here? And on cue, Natsuki walks in the space classroom and she just breaks down. I'm not even gonna lie, this feels a bit comedic. Everything is gonna be okay, we're all friends. Oh hey Yai, what? Natsuki is here? Hey guys, I'm here guys. Ah, oh, I'm dying! That's basically what happened. Natsuki falls to the ground and her whole body begins to just convulse and shift. Everything around her is starting to glitch and she breaks apart. Body begins to move like puppet on strings and her hair color begins changing. Her voice speaks out to us, but this isn't Natsuki. I was waiting for you. I waited a long time. Are you listening? The space around her begins glitching even more as her hair and eye color continue to slowly change. Play with me instead. It's all I have. Play with me. The puppet begins violently twisting her neck in an attempt to snap it. Everyone does their best to hold her down as Monica tries to alter her character file. Both of her memories are now set to true and Natsuki keeps going and with nothing being able to stop her. Kozu then walks in and watches what's going down and does only what she can do. Smashes a potted plant on Natsuki's head. And we knock her out! Good job! We did it! Let's go team! Oh wait, shit, why is Kozu in the space classroom? And why is she fine? That's not fair, even Mori got glitched out, why is Kozu special? Kozu once again acts malicious towards the eye, and the player just tosses them both in a room because yeah, nobody wants to deal with that. Natsuki quickly wakes up and she actually has the most realistic reaction to everything. It's kind of funny just how confused and she's like, Ah! What is that? Ah! 
who are you? Monica slaps her so she can calm down. Dang, these characters do that a lot. And Natsuki is like, you didn't have to do that. And Monica is a bit horrified at what she's done. Oh, hey, consequences. It's okay, Monica. You're not the antagonist. I believe in you. Yai, Kozu, and Mori then all come out. Wow, perfect timing. And Natsuki puts her hands on her hips and is like, uh, you're gonna have to explain all of this. Natsuki is not what you think, I promise. Sayori then tells Natsuki that she'll tell her everything in private, and when Natsuki tries to stand, she almost falls back and Meiji catches her. Natsuki then thanks the player, but Meiji is like, uh, actually, I'm just me right now, he's over there. And Natsuki looks at the both of them and is just like, what the fuck? And that's honestly so funny. Once again, the most realistic reaction out of all these characters. Kozu apparently still doesn't know the full story, so we take the time and tell her everything about DDLC and what happens and such. Natsuki yells at everyone, and at first, I didn't like how she chose violence, but honestly, understandable. We just told her the secrets of the universe, and she's been living a lie this entire time. I really don't blame her for being not only starstruck, but just so angry and confused, and also a little betrayed. Monica was in on it too, and even Sayori, and also they're in space, this is whack. It really is a lot when you think about it. Monica almost cries because Natsuki yelled at her, and okay, I know I said that I wanted consequences for Monica, to, you know, for her to show us how broken she is, but I didn't mean to just render her to, uh, MC, she yelled at me. It's hard to say because, yeah, these characters are dealing with so much, and I can only imagine how Monica is doing, like, mentally. I mean, how many times has she had to quickly put herself back together? So it makes sense now that why she's breaking down so easily, especially after she almost took her own life. <sighs> Damn it, I want to hate it, but it's just, ugh. Copium? Maybe? I don't know. I'm happy even Monica says it and realizes it. That actually makes me feel better about this whole scene. We talk with Yai and Kozu and try and figure out why things are different this time around, and this switches to us fully realizing that we use the console when not even Monica is able to use it. Which is funny because yeah, we realized that a while ago, but sure, yeah, we, we realize it again. Sayori then programs some chairs and we make a whole new room. Whoa! Natsuki still wonders why we didn't tell anyone, especially Yuri, because she- Wait, what? Are you- are you serious? Oh my god, she's a nerd! I wonder if she knows the Star Wars languages. Do you think Yuri would like Star Wars? I really like this moment because for once, the player just finally reflects. And not like a, oh shit, I messed up! Uh, like, no, he just, he walks through everything and just talks about his choices. He talks about everything he has done and his thought process, and I'm, I'm honestly surprised. You know what? I like Natsuki being here. She's adding a lot so far. The player mentions that he didn't have much of a plan going in, and right now it's kind of too late to bring Yuri in and tell her. I personally don't see why or how, I mean, it'd be stressful, but I'm sure we can quickly knock her out, <laughs> like we did Natsuki. Natsuki then asks us why we can't just change her file, and it's because it just changes back. I honestly didn't know this, I feel like we just skipped over that. I don't really like how the player just dismisses Yuri to just an obsessive Yandere. I get why, but Bro acts like he hasn't seen how much Yuri has been suffering because of her mom. Yeah, I mean, I guess she's a bit too far gone, but... I'll talk about this more later, because oh boy, I have way too much to talk about with Yuri. It's completely natural for the player to be afraid of Yuri entering the space classroom. Heck, I wouldn't want to either, especially after she tried to stab us. But what other option is there? For her to get worse? Keep going to school and avoiding her? I don't really see any other option. I really appreciate Natsuki wanting to apologize to Yuri for before. That's a level of maturity I didn't expect from her. Even though she does fight with her, she still does really care a lot about her. Oh my god, I completely forgot about that. Meiji and the player merging. Anyways, let's eat. Woo! After the meal, everyone breaks off into their own places and we look through the files. Kozu is the first and yeah, it's pretty normal. The only weird thing is that she doesn't have any beta memories. We switch to Yuri's file and all of her worst traits have gone up. We try and make changes but it won't allow us to save it. We just keep getting an error. Kozu and Mori end up going home after a while and we just keep searching. The player tries to check his file but the password is still blocking the path. He tries logging in with a bunch of passwords he's used before, but none of them seem to work. But then out of nowhere, Yai is like, what if you try them at the same time? I mean, that sounds a bit weird, but sure, can't hurt to try. Monica and the player try logging in at the same time, and oh wow, look, it works, can't believe that. So yeah, so they do it at the same time, they hit enter, the screen freezes, and the modem seems to get louder, that's not suspicious, and just like that, they're in, it's crazy. I do have a slight theory, it's nothing much, but I wonder if somehow the player is now tied to this world more than he should be? This mod is called World of Dreams, after all. Maybe this world is under his control? I guess it kind of explains what happened after the end of the Christmas special with that weird voice, but sadly there's no real evidence backing this up. It could just be because he's from the real world, so of course in order to check his file in the game, he needs to try to alter it from both something from the real world and something that exists in the game. But I don't know. The player then screams in frustration, honestly same, after not being able to accomplish much. Man, this guy really is me for real. 
So everyone decides to call it a night, and the player decides to take this chance to talk to Sayori and Monica about what happened earlier. Honestly, it's been a while since Sayori has gotten a chance to be involved like this. I'm also happy that Monica could depend and lean on Sayori. As much as I like Monica being all to ourselves, is she definitely needs another support system, and same goes for Sayori. It's good that they were finally able to talk things out again and just, you know, have them cry a little bit. <laughs> Everyone heads to their rooms and Monica asks us to promise her that everything is going to be okay, even if it's just a lie. So does this mean things are going to get worse tomorrow? God, I hope not. Thursday, October 26, 2017. The player wakes up from a nightmare. He gathers himself, but he can't seem to remember it. That's odd. I wonder- Oh great, they're here now. No, no, Yai, we didn't do anything. What the- What the- Natsuki? What the heck? I'm not that bad! Apparently they found a letter that was addressed to Meiji. Okay, that's cool. And... Oh shit, wait a minute. So, yeah, it's the letter from Yuri, and... <sighs> I need an adult. The wildest part is that apparently Yuri got a poem from the player? Which isn't even possible. For one, we didn't even have the poem minigame. Also, we've only gone to the club once, and that was before Monica ever showed up. Also, how does she even know where we live? So the new plan for today is to track down Yuri and talk with her and hopefully knock some sense into her. Sayori then hugs us out of nowhere and we get some special bun time, we love that. Thank you gods for this gift. Sayori tells us we should worry more about Yuri cause she's sad, among other things. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. The player tries theorizing on what could have caused such development with Yuri and Sayori tries to get a word in but the player keeps talking until Sayori finally screams at us and she gets mad at us because as Sayori puts it, we're talking about Yuri like she's some sort of a science experiment. Hearing this, the player starts to break down a bit and realize that Yuri isn't a problem that needs to be solved. The game is really testing my patience. Fine, I'm doing it. I'll, I might as well just talk about Yuri now then. So, I have very mixed feelings on how they're handling Yuri. And by that, I mean that Yuri was such a big waste of potential. I'll go over it in more detail later, but the biggest problem that I have so far is that I don't really have a reason to care about Natsuki or Yuri, or even Mori. And that's fine. That's There's a lot of characters and a lot is happening, but Yuri is the main antagonist of the act. She was the whole reason why everyone was so afraid of what might happen in the future. They treated her like some sort of bomb that might explode this entire mod. Which doesn't make sense because we've had moments of seeing Yuri act normal. And yeah, sure, I get it, we're worried about what Yuri's going to become, but are you seriously telling me that right now is the moment that it's like, oh shit, maybe Yuri isn't a problem that we need to solve? It's like, shut up. I can't believe that nobody ever truly saw her as a person other than in this moment right now. Honestly, Sayori, like where was this attitude at the beginning of the game? Or when we found out about Yuri's mother? It was always about we need to avoid the club and Yuri at all costs because she's going to go insane and figure out what to do. And now that she's too far gone, now's the time we need to talk to her and, and she needs a friend and stuff. Like, bro, it's already too late. She's acting irrational right now. She almost stabbed us. And the only thing to do right now is to wonder why. Is it because of the script? Is it because she's lonely? Is it her home life? Is it the bullying? Yeah, it doesn't really matter, but I do agree with Sayori. Yuri doesn't deserve any of this. We shouldn't be treating the situation like this. So why have we? If Sayori is gonna say this in general, I feel like she should have said it like four hours ago. Like, honestly. I feel like what the game wanted to do f was for us to also be worried about Yuri and then finally realizing, oh shit, she's really sad. We need to save her and not just leave her behind because she's crazy. But this was done so bad. Yes, we have seen that Yuri's depressed and agitated, but it's also hard to gauge that when all we ever do is talk about how dangerous she is. Also, if we're gonna talk about how depressed she is, that was like 10 hours ago. That was so long ago. Here's what I would have done personally. Have the player or Sayori realize this way fucking sooner. We had the perfect opportunity way back when the MC was at Yuri's house. That should have been the moment where we truly saw the real Yuri. The Yuri that wasn't bound by the script. The helpless girl who desperately needed someone to lean on. The lonely girl who was about to lose her mother and didn't know what to do. In that moment back at the apartment, that's when we should have realized this. It would have been so much better if at that moment when Yuri cried to us telling us she didn't want to be alone, we have an epiphany and decide to treat her like a friend moving forward. And then we decide to go to the club, we hang out with her and we try to guide her. We get to spend time with her and enjoy being her friend. That way when Yuri and Natsuki have their arguments, it feels more dreadful because this isn't like her. We know that she's a nice person and for some reason she's still being directed by the script. We've seen how she really is, so we want to reach out more because, yeah, this isn't like her. And when we find her in the bathroom doing her thing, we can once again have that moment of trying to reach out to her, where hopefully, because we treat her so nicely and now that we're her friend, she will realize, oh shit, what have I done? I'm a monster. Instead of the player cautiously trying to approach Yuri because she has the knife, instead, he just walks up to her and says, Yuri, this isn't you. I know how you are. I know you don't want to do this. I believe in you, Yuri. 
And then she snaps out of it and cries. And then after we're trying to comfort her, she then switches on a dime and tries to slash at us. But the player doesn't break down and he just continues to yell out, Yuri, this isn't you. Please come back to me. Come back to us. But she doesn't listen and she just runs off. That would have hit so much harder. After making those slight changes, it would have instantly helped this moment. Not only because it makes us care about her, but also it helps Yuri feel more important and more like a person who is truly suffering because of the game script and more like someone that we need to truly save. I don't know, let's see what happens next. Everyone wonders if we should tell her about the game and Natsuki wonders why don't you, honestly. I think the best bet is to do what we did for Kozu and show her the space classroom and have Monaga, Natsuki, and maybe even Sayori tell her everything. And then maybe we can make her remember her memories depending on how she takes it. So the player decides to show Natsuki the whole merging thing, so yeah, we do that. We then make our way to school and Meiji asks us if we're sure on telling Yuri, and then the player goes, yeah, cause Sayori is right, Yuri is really sad. We make our way to class, should've just went to go find Yuri, but I guess. We find a note in our desk by, oddly enough, Yai. The note basically just tells us that Yai used her influence around the school to make sure that we don't get picked on anymore. I mean, okay, that's nice of her. You know what? Thank you, Yai. I, I'm glad you're on the team. <laughs> Maru and Kozu come over and say that it was such a bad thing because now we have a target on our backs, but you guys gotta realize that this is character development. Lunchtime comes around and Monica and MC go to confront Yuri. We approach Yuri and for some reason she's a bit snappy. We Monica tries to get a word in, but Yuri is throwing around the rumors again. Out of nowhere, we mention Yuri's mother and, well, I think it's safe to assume that the worst has happened. Yuri then says that she's sorry and that something is wrong with her lately, but she doesn't know what it is. She feels like her heart is going to burst and she's getting overwhelmed with energy and emotions that won't let up. She then starts hyperventilating and Monica says that she's here for her. Yuri then goes on and apologizes for her behavior and for the MC seeing this side of her. Wow. I... I actually really like this moment. Um... Huh. Things are actually going really well. Natsuki then comes in the room out of nowhere and... Wait, she looks a bit worried. Wait, why did the music change? So, I thought we had got rid of Natsuki's dad with the console, but here he is, with a gun, pointed at Natsuki. Where did this come from? <laughs> Yuri all of a sudden just reacts calmly and even talks back to the guy. What are you doing? The guy then puts the gun directly in Yuri's face and she just stands there, menacingly. She even calls him a coward and oh my god, are you serious? So now his attention is on us, and Natsuki tries to reason with her dad, but he isn't having it, saying that she is his property and she will obey. Monica tries to say anything but... Something begins to snap inside both Meiji and the player. This guy has a real gun. This guy could actually kill us if he wanted to. This guy almost did. He almost hurt Monica. He tried to hurt Monica. The player begins approaching the man and he swiftly points the gun at his head. He will not get away with this. The console then appears and Meiji and the player once again merge. He speaks but nobody understands. He somehow knocks his gun away and begins using the console to target the man, trying to cause him any sort of pain. The MC then snaps out of it quickly and the console disappears, feeling nothing but pain in his head and falling to his knees. Just then the nurse comes in with the police and just like that, the nightmare is over. Everyone is safe. Are you serious? Yuri, you almost died and this is all you care about? So yeah, she runs off. Of course it wasn't gonna be that easy. Mori finds us and we make our way to the nurse's office and we take a breather. The MC is now alone with his thoughts and just thinks to himself. He almost killed someone. His rage was so out of control again that he almost did it again. This can't be happening again. I mean, what just happened? He didn't even hesitate. Tries his best to remain calm, but this only gets worse. His breathing starting to get more out of control and he begins hyperventilating. He used the console again. He lost control. Mori then puts a hand on his back, but he barely notices. The silence starts to feel suffocating. His breathing starting to become more out of control as he tries to get a word out. But there's nothing. His mind is shattering, his heart is racing, and there's an unending scream that now fills the room. You are a murderer. Killer. Everything you did is for nothing. You are nothing. Nothing will save them. It's hopeless. It's meaningless. 
You don't belong here. There is nothing you can do. You have no control. All you do is hurt people. No one is safe around you. You might as well just delete. The MC's eyes fly open with tears streaming down his face. Mori is holding him in place, helping him not fall apart. Slowly, the MC is brought back into reality, and the inner screams that were in his mind begin to finally fade away. And finally it sets in, just how bad things truly are. But we can't stop. We can't afford to stop. <sighs> I'm depressed now. Once again, the writing is phenomenal, but I will of course give my two cents because I don't want to be depressed anymore. I wish we got more of this in the beginning. I may be nitpicking here, but I think it would have been really cool to have the player and Meiji talk to each other about this kind of stuff, like early in the beginning. Maybe about like how Meiji just wants all this to end and the player tells him that we have a job to do, we're the hero, you know, we, you know, we gotta do this. Also, how sick would it be if the player was the one who told Meiji in the beginning that they need to keep going? And then fast forward like 10 hours in the mod, Meiji is now the one to tell the player that they need to keep going together. Imagine Meiji's the one whose resolve is now so much stronger while the player is breaking down. That'd be pretty sick. And then the player could be like, wow, Meiji, you've grown so much. You're now telling me that we need to move forward. Wow. I'm just saying, missed opportunity. I feel like if we got that kind of stuff in the beginning, this moment would have hit so much harder. It already does. But you can make it better. <laughs> You can make me cry. <laughs> Doing this would also kind of give Meiji an arc. I don't I don't know if you noticed, but he doesn't really have one or really much to do. Not every character needs one, but he is quite literally the main character, so having him just be exhausted and wanting this to all end, or even the player just breaking down and Meiji being there to pick up the pieces, would be great for him to get, you know, for a chance for him to get more involved. Monica asks us what to do about Yuri. Well, I don't know, since Natsuki and Monica can't talk to her anymore, maybe the MC could just message Yuri to meet him somewhere and then shove her in the space classroom or something? I don't know what else we can do. We, went, we make our way to the club and even though we went through all that very traumatic stuff and we should be bonded for life, Yuri is acting cold and distant because of course she is. Natsuki walks up to her and once again Yuri is just keeping her distance and saying what she needs to. Why? <laughs> No, honestly, why? Not even Mori is able to get anything out of her, and Mori did nothing wrong. Monica then mentions that she was able to pull up the console without needing the computer or anything, and was able to check on Yuri's character file. She was actually able to do this because she watched the player pull up the console twice already. Honestly, that's pretty cool. Time passes by, and Yuri isn't back from getting her water, and everyone just remains silent, not even vibing, just waiting for the time to pass, not even knowing what else to say to each other. Finally, Yuri comes back, and it's like all the tension just gets way worse. Monica tries helping her with the tea set, but Yuri forcefully pulls it away, and then everyone just goes off in their separate ways. Okay, I'm gonna say this one last time. This is probably a bad idea, but just open up the space classroom and just kick her in or something. Like, let's just show Yuri everything. I, like, now that we finally have Yuri in the same room as us, can we just, like, tell her everything? Because, like, I don't want this to continue. I, this is painful to watch. Plus, we don't have time for this. The week is almost over. What if Yuri gets worse? Yuri is over here glaring at us. She's actually pissed. Please, let's just get this over with. Yuri all of a sudden gets a call and... <sighs> her mother passes away. The group then leave and make their way to the house when they stumble into Kotonoa. Wow, it's been a while, and she's gone. Cool. <laughs> Yai then confirms that yeah, she's the daughter of a Yakuza family. Neat. <laughs> who asked? Like honestly, who asked? We make our way home and thankfully Natsuki is just as frustrated as I am. It's honestly it's very refreshing to have her here. I was worried that she was going to be non-existent because we already have so many other characters here. She doesn't do anything per se, but her being here and her reaction to things just have a nice contrast. It's funny because nobody before her has acted like this other than the player and I don't know why. This sucks. Heck, even Sayori is saying that she's more determined now, which is crazy because aren't you tired? I'm tired. She says that we haven't lost yet. Uh, I think we have. Meiji then gets a text from Yuri. I'm not even gonna ask how she got it, but you know what to do. <laughs> Time to trick her into meeting up with us and then BAM! Shove her into the space classroom. Let's go. Oh. She, uh, sent, uh, I need an adult. Oh fuck, she has our pen! I forgot we lost that! Ew, no, you can keep it. Uh, come on. This part of the mod is really good at making you feel nothing but dread. I also feel exhausted. It's so tiring just to never get a win and having to read what just happened earlier. It sucks because we were so close. Tell me how you're all feeling in the comments because honestly, I'm so drained. <laughs> I'm actually going to take this moment to just say, hey, how are you doing? I'd love to hear what you're all thinking in the comments so far. Are you enjoying this? Have you had any fun? I haven't. Uh, man, this has been a one wild ride. We're almost done though. Only like five more hours to go. You should probably go get some water and maybe a snack. We're so close to being done. <sighs> okay, let's go. Everyone is quiet and not really sure what to do, and then we smell something. We rush over to the kitchen, and dinner is now ruined. Gosh, we can't even get one thing right. This is actually awful. Natsuki to the rescue! She's gonna finish and fix the food. So happy you're here. 
Kozu and Yai decide to help out, and during all this, Yai then kind of dozes off and starts talking about how she's tried so hard to make Kozu forgive her. The player at first tells her straight up that not everyone is going to forgive you just like that, and then he tries to be more comforting and he fails at it. And then Yai starts to cry, saying how she's just in everyone's way, that she doesn't deserve anyone's kindness. The player then switches gears and tells her that she does deserve it, that it will take time, she isn't anyone's toy or anything, she can be better, and he will help her find herself again so she can be better. This next part then sucks, but apparently Yai's family knew about the whole uncle business and didn't do anything about it. All because he supports the family and I guess this is his reward. It's absolutely disgusting. MC finishes by telling Yai not to stop trying. That she belongs here with them. They then serve everyone the food and right before Yai can do anything, the MC gives her a smile. As a little confrontation that yes, she can stay and should stay. That it's okay to be here. And Yai finally relaxes. We finish our food and everyone heads to bed, but Mori stays back to clean the dishes. But for some reason, she keeps spacing out, saying that it feels like she doesn't belong, and that it feels like there's two people inside me clamoring to be heard? Holy shit, does this confirm my theory? They finish up and the player proceeds to scream into the pillow because things suck. I feel you, man. <laughs> Monica then out of nowhere asks us if we've ever think about having children. Whoa, okay, Monica, I'm not ready for that kind of relationship. Monica explains that she wouldn't want a future in this world. She wouldn't want to put her future kids through the hell that is this world. She says that she always wanted to be a mother deep down, but it sucks being here. The player then says, yeah, well, we're still young, so good night. <laughs> I'm not even joking, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> Honestly understandable, I was gonna laugh at this but this was a near death experience. I will say though that I do find it funny how the player is like, bro let's talk about this another time, what the heck is wrong with you, we just started dating. <laughs> Alright, I think it's time for bed. <laughs> Friday, October 27th, 2017. Everyone is gone, there's nothing but a dark void. I failed. Monica, I let you down. I couldn't keep our promise. Sayori, I wasn't able to save you from your depression, and now you're gone. Yuri, I should have been there to support you when you were all alone. Natsuki, I didn't protect you when I swore I would. I let you get taken away and it's all my fault. Everyone, I'm so sorry. I tried my hardest. Meiji, say something. Please, please tell me you're still here. I shouldn't have put your body through so much! I'm sorry! What? What? No! I... Meiji, I... Wait! Please come back! Monica... What? I'm... I'm... I'm not doing this! I swear! I would never hurt you! I didn't put that, I swear! No, no, Monica! Don't leave! Monica! Monica! <laughs> Sorry, I got bored. This nightmare sequence is everything I've been hoping for. It's a full build up and breakdown of the player's whole character. Ah, see what I did there? It gets these care. And, anyways, it starts off of everyone being gone and him not being able to fathom it. Everyone tells him to hold on regardless if it's their time to go. And Meiji starts off lifeless, but then awakens to criticize the player's actions and not for doing what he promised, wrecking his body all the time and being so careless, always so impulsive and angry. Even when he not only swore to Meiji, but also Sayori and even Monica that he'd be careful. He never once stood by what he said. He always went on and got out of control. He came here so he can help, yet all the player's ever done has been for nothing. Everyone around him is suffering and it's all his fault. Meiji then... If you don't want to see Sayori hanging around, then feel free to skip this, but... I'm just gonna blur it regardless, actually. I'm not comfortable seeing it either. Meiji shows Sayori hanging. He thought he saved her, but look at her. It still happened. He told everyone not to worry, but Sayori still got hurt. But if Monica was in danger, he'd rush to do something, right? No question to ask. I mean, that's already happened before. Meiji keeps going and says what's been on his mind the entire time. Of course, Meiji mentions them splitting up, that it hasn't been a priority in a long time, and even I forgot about it. Meiji's right when he says that it was completely thrown out the window. 
Then Meiji is lying there while his parents try and talk to him. They're completely helpless as he doesn't say a word. His body is just lifeless. His parents only plead and continue to try to reach out, but it doesn't work. They try and try, but to no avail. They then look at the player, demanding a reason on why he's gone and why he did it. Sayori comes back and the same rope that hurt her starts wrapping around the player's neck, choking him, dragging him away. Sayori wonders why he even wants to save them. After all, they're just characters, right? The world is just a game after all. He's the only real person. All the player's ever done has prolonged everyone's suffering. Natsuki appears and wonders what she did wrong. What did she do to deserve this? Why did she have to go? She just wanted a friend. She just wanted to play. Yuri then appears and she wants the end to come. For it to come and to be able to spend that time with the player as she slices a blade into him. And finally, Monica, afraid of the player's actions. Why is he deleting her? Why is he hurting her? He promised to protect her. So why is he pulling up the console? Everyone is gone now. Everyone he knew and tried to protect is gone. Forever. And it's all his fault. He should have done better. He should have been better. He let everything get to him and he refused to fix things. He was too cautious. Not cautious enough. Not determined enough. Made careless mistakes. Did horrible things. Hurt everyone around him. Changed their world and it's all his fault. Oh, this is some pretty heavy stuff. My first time playing this, I was already so done with everything that happened before, this was the final nail in the coffin. I feel like I wanted to take a nap. <laughs> Honestly, the only thing that was missing was Monica's whole speech about the hero bit. I wish it was at least mentioned a little bit. This part is definitely nitpicky because like, I feel like when Sayori said, why are you helping us? We're not real. Is it to help your conscious? There should have been like a bit more that was expanded upon this whole heroism. Cause like the player really does do a lot and he really does like leap out whenever he can to help people. We could have really like explored this a little bit and gone further on why he does that. Is it because he loves the DDLC characters and wants them to give a happy ending or is he just naturally like that? Or is he more selfish? Maybe he does feel obligated and now he just wants to go home? I don't know, like we really could have like talked about this more. But yeah, of course this is nitpicky. Yeah, this, ho this whole thing like hits, I like it. Another like nitpicky thing I would have wished I saw was that at the end, I really wish he would have kind of like had a mental breakdown. I know he already kind of did, but like more like about how he just wants to go home. One thing I always was kind of confused about was in the entire mod, we never really mentioned his parents. I understand we never really had a moment to do that, but like I'm just still kind of surprised that like he's never really had a moment to talk to Monica about like his family life or like his life back at home. Other than like one time where like he does kind of remember his parents and then he feels a bit lonely and then Monica's like, don't worry, be your family and then they just move on immediately after and and it's like why why do you mention that i i personally would have loved like at the very end of the nightmare sequence like before he woke up he would have been like fuck this i want to go home and then he just like starts screaming and saying like he just wants to go home he's done with this he doesn't want to be here anymore because he you know because he keeps messing up i feel like that would have been like the perfect ending to all this but i don't know and once again i'm nitpicking I don't know, maybe that would have also ruined like the whole theming of this because like Nightmare Sequence is already like long enough, it's already like 30 minutes. But maybe they could have cut out that first part and just lead straight into everyone appearing and telling him that he messed up and then just fading away. L I don't know, like I said, I'm nitpicking and I, I still really like this moment. And in this moment, I feel like the player now fully realizes like what he's capable of and what's going on and he's afraid. There was a long buildup of him starting off worried but confident. And then over time as things don't work out and the world changes and he realizes that, you know, he's way out of his element. Things really do start to change even more and finally at his breaking point. It's all really subtle until finally it isn't, and I think that works really well. I really like what the story is doing so far. Player wakes up and Monica is by his side. He pulls her into a tight embrace, clinging on and hoping that this is real, finally relieved that it's all over. All he could do is just repeat the same phrase that was haunting him. I'm sorry. I won't delete you. I wouldn't. I'm sorry. He slowly opens his eyes and realizes that everyone is here. He closes them once more and just focuses on Monica, trying to calm himself down as best as he can. This is the first time he's been like this. The first time everyone around him has seen this side of him, seen how afraid he is to fail, how afraid he is of what's to come, and not being able to prevent it. How long has it been since he's been holding this in? How much more can he continue to take before he just completely breaks? Slowly the player is able to relax and finally able to let go of his grip on Monica. It's completely freezing. He's supposed to feel safe in her arms, but he only feels uncertainty. He feels the freezing void of what could happen next, and what will happen next if he truly does fail. But. Life doesn't seem so hopeless when he's surrounded by the warmth of others. He just has to let them in. He has to cherish everyone for him to live. He has to push aside his fears and stand alongside everyone. He has to continue trying so they can smile again, so that everyone can forge a path together, so that everyone can be happy, so that everyone can be free. 
sorry, I've been playing a lot of Persona 3 Reload. I know I said this a lot, but no, this is my favorite moment of the mod, hands down. This is this is great. It's done so incredibly well, and the music too, just gosh, the music is great. It really makes you feel like it's not the end, that we can still go on. This moment is nothing but love. It's everyone he's helped all standing here, supporting him. Yes, he's made mistakes, but look at everyone. Look how far we've come. There's still a chance. And damn it, that's what this mod is all about. Let's go. I'm gonna go do the impossible right now. Watch. The player being so vulnerable, it's just, I don't know. It's its cute. It's wholesome to like see everyone supporting him. And like, it's like he's a little kid and Monica's just, ah, I love it. It's so hard to believe that we'd ever get a moment like this. Like, yet here we are. Let's let's go. I can't wait to get the person again in five minutes. We wake up and shower and share a little moment with Monica. God, I love you. And then there's a knock at the door. Everyone freezes for a moment, already preparing for the worst, but thankfully it's just Mori. Dang, really playing with my heart, aren't you? Mori brings over some McDonald's! Woo! The player then remembers when he first came here. Back then, he realized that he was only living the fantasy that every DDLC fan has. You know, saving everyone. And that reality hadn't set in then. Now he just wants to go home. <laughs> yeah, we did it! He said it! That's all I've ever wanted! The novelty of living this nerdy fantasy is starting to wear off, bro. <laughs> He can't focus on his past life right now. He's stuck here and there's nothing he can do about it. I'm actually really happy, this is so cool. I do wonder how much time has passed in the real world though. I like to think that this place exists in its own separate space, and in reality he's only been gone for like an hour or so in, in the real world. Though it wouldn't really make much sense if this place runs parallel to the real world, just cause this world resets and goes back in time, so maybe two weeks really have taken place in the real world? I don't know. It, or maybe this is an Attack on Titan situation where all timelines are like flowing and existing at the same time, and- But then again, what about the Christmas special? That one was way more than just a dream, so is that its own like vacuum and like own personal like space? So many questions. We don't have the luxury to think about that though. There isn't much time. We need to focus and it's time to finish what we started. We make our way to school and the rain is the worst it's ever been. The school is also oddly empty. There's barely any students around. The teacher finally walks in and begins teaching, all while the storm is only getting heavier, the wind becoming more aggressive. Time passes but it doesn't feel like it. The bell for lunch rings through the empty school but everyone looks around confused. Class only started a few minutes ago. Unless... the game is now trying to progress. It's skipping unimportant moments as if this were a visual novel. Time is now scarce, irrelevant, it's rushing to the end. Can't believe it. <laughs> Kotonoa then appears and asks us if we considered her offer. We just shake it off and say that we haven't had much time to think about it. Honestly, we, yeah, that is true. She looks a bit suspicious but takes her answer and walks off, and we make our way to meet everyone. Sayori looks at the code and notices that there's nothing there, meaning that there was a literal time skip that just happened, a fade to black. Nobody remembers anything. This is really getting scary. Monica assures us of what we said. Everything is gonna be fine. Mori comes in and mentions that she was going to get some medication from Meiji, but the nurse didn't come in. But that's impossible. We just saw her. We just got some medicine from her a few minutes ago. Kozu then wonders if she was deleted. If everyone has been deleted. That they've outlived their lives and the game is finally getting ready to end. The whole world is ready to end. Monica wants to check the world file, but it requests a password. And somehow the player types in his password and it opens. And somehow, over half the population is now gone. Yae confirms this by saying that usually in novels, when the weather is bad, it's because there's a climax coming. Wow, really? That's crazy. It's almost like we haven't had like 10 of those so far. Wait a minute. Wait, I didn't mean to say it like that. It, it took me a moment. I was like, climax is coming. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Natsuki and Yae share a moment and god, I love this. Look, we're friends. They're joking and having such a good time. It's almost like the end of the world isn't actually coming after all. Before we know it, the day is over and we're back at the literature club. Mori ended up getting a text from Yuri saying that she isn't coming to school or the club, that she's busy with family stuff. And the way that she messages this is so distant and formal. Then she leaves a message for the MC. And guess what? It's a fucking nude. <laughs> Kotonoa walks in the club room and asks where Yuri is and then walks off. Riveting. We spy on her phone call and yeah, she's pure evil. <laughs> now that Yuri has outlived her usefulness, she's going to evict her from her apartment. Yai's had enough and walks up to her, slapping her. Honestly, deserved. You can't walk up to us and be like, long live the king, bitch, who do you think you are? Big moment for Yai. You tell her, girl. Go girl boss it up. Player then grabs Kotonoa's phone and snaps it in half. Let's fucking go. And then we open the space classroom and drag her inside. And damn, Mori is scary. I love it. Yes, queen. We drag Kotonoa in and she glitches out. You know the routine. She does the struggle and apparently she's way stronger than everyone else. She even tries clawing her eyes out. Damn, girl. She's kind of freaky like that. I'm sorry. Everyone is actually fully struggling against her. They have her pinned down and yet she's able to resist and shake around like she's possessed. To the point where she actually pushes everyone back and gets distance. She also stands there and tells us that it sees all. It knows all. 
then falls on the ground unconscious. The player can't help but think, why? Monica and Meiji's reaction wasn't violent at all, but Mori and Yai's were. Mori tried shoving a pencil in her eye, Yai tried disfiguring herself, and Natsuki tried to snap her neck. And then Kotonoa tried to claw her eyes out. And then Kozu... Well, I guess she's just built different, I don't know. Mori looks at Kotonoa and is very conflicted. Is she looking at her friend from the first timeline, or her enemy from the second? Yai snaps her out of it and tells her that her friend is back. Everyone sits around and waits for Kotonoa to regain composure. Once she does, we fill her in on everything. I'm not gonna lie, I'm just gonna skip this part a little bit, cause yeah, we've already we already know what's going on. I'm not gonna call this part repetitive, but I'm just saying like, yeah, it's getting a bit old, we get it. I do like how Kotonoa is just so disgusted with herself, even admitting that she could have helped Yuri's mother but decided not to. And then we all switched to have food again. Yay! <laughs> yeah, okay, this is this is getting a little repetitive. Yeah, let's just skip to the end. The player mentions how the MC is supposed to be with Yuri and stuck in the classroom, but for some reason, the script didn't do anything like that. So, does this mean it's over? Do we make it? Sleepover! We're all gonna have a good time. <laughs> we do one last check at the files, and apparently the player's mother is good at computers and stuff. Monica sees how tired we are and gives us a lap pillow! Let's go! Whoa! It's kind of strange, but everything feels so calm. I mean it, like even though there's still so much we don't know, everything feels so uncertain, but everything is kind of good right now. Nothing bad happened today, for the most part. Everything is just fine. Everyone gets ready for bed, but Kotonoa stays up and she can't help but just vent. Just who is she? Who is she supposed to be? She feels so much inner turmoil over her actions. Her Act 1 and Act 2 counterparts couldn't be any more different. Unlike everyone else, she had the most drastic change. In this moment, she's so scared, so frail, so helpless. The player can't help but wonder, was this really right to show her this reality that no one deserves to know? There wasn't an emergency to get her in here, only rage, only resentfulness. And now this shell is broken off and she's afraid. She ends up crying herself to sleep, holding on to the player. Monica just smiles at us. We expect her to be a bit jealous, but she actually looks like she's happy. She looks at us with so much love. Friday, October 27, 2017. The player sits up in horror, hearing a loud thunderous sound. Everyone gathers and looks over at the world. What's happening? What are these sounds? What's going on? It's still the morning, but, but it's impossible to notice that the night even passed. We check the computer and it sounds like it's on its last legs. The fan's spinning louder and faster than ever before. The computer is now insanely hot, running in overdrive. We look through the files and there's only 9 people in the world remaining. This isn't good. We need to find Yurio, she'll be deleted. Everyone breaks down now realizing that everyone is gone. Their parents, their friends, everyone is gone. Sayori tries to establish that this isn't over, but the space classroom shakes and rumbles, causing Sayori to hit her head with a bit of blood on her hands. We rush over to get her patched up and... We're back in the school. It's dark. It's quiet. Meiji isn't responding. We're stuck. As the world continues to corrupt and fall apart, we try and make our way to find one of the exits. And we hear something. We make our way to the exit, but we're brought back to the same corridor. There's no escaping. Then a voice calls out to us. It's Yuri. She found us. She puts something over our face and we lose consciousness. We soon awake to us being tied to a chair with Yuri on top of us. We try to speak, but we can't. Yuri looks at us and she's smiling. She then quickly cuts her cheek with her knife. Yuri's smile only grows wider. This isn't Yuri anymore. She continues to try and get closer to us and we beg for this to stop. Yuri keeps the knife close to our body, gliding it around, toying with us. We try our best to kick, to move, to do anything, to speak, but we can't. We've been drugged and we can't do anything other than sit here and let Yuri have her way. After what feels like hours, Monica finally finds us and knocks Yuri away, shocked at what she's done. Yuri tries to slash at her, but she dodges it and kicks the knife away. Natsuki then runs in and tries to untie us, but Yuri pushes her away and puts the knife to our neck. Everyone finally rushes in, but there's nothing they can do. Yuri then lashes out at Kotonoa for everything she's ever done, and in her frustration she ends up cutting our neck. 
Natsuki tries to reason to Yuri, saying that she's sorry and she's always looked up to her, that she's always considered her a friend and that she cared. Natsuki then throws something at her. Yuri then falls and Natsuki tackles her down and tries to keep her pinned down, using everything that she has just to keep her there. Everyone moves in and helps, but Yuri isn't the same. She grabs a container and fills the room with gas, and everyone loses consciousness. But, Sayori. Now that Yuri's distracted, everyone helps the MC from the rope and they get everyone inside the space classroom. Yuri is now inside the space classroom, thrashing around. The classroom is now starting to break apart, and we slam the door shut, and... Everyone is here. But Yuri is motionless. She's not dead. She's not quite alive either. Monica quickly fixes her character file and makes her remember who she used to be. Yuri is too strong and throws Monica off and pulls out her knife again. But Natsuki was able to knock it out of her hands and Yuri falls. It's... it's over. It's all over. The player tries his best to remain sane, but Monica sits by him and tries her best. We did it. We really did it. It's done. And Yuri is finally breathing. This nightmare is finally over. Before everyone can fully relax, the world vanishes, only leaving the darkness of space engulfed in flames. In Act 3, the only thing left now is the space classroom and everyone else inside. Everything else is gone. Yuri then wakes up and gathers herself. The player tries to comfort her, but Yuri slaps his hand away. We then tell her everything as she sobs on the floor, clinging onto Sayori. And everyone looks at the player, wondering what to do next. Shit, I don't know. <laughs> Yuri looks out the window, demanding an explanation. Monica tries to say something, but Yuri shuts her down. Yuri looks at us, telling us that we lied to her. And she doesn't know about what yet, but... What? That we lied to her and that she doesn't know about what yet. Oh my god. Yuri feels betrayed because we didn't tell her anything in the second week. That's saying that it was all our fault for not going to her immediately instead of lying. She grabs onto our shirt and pulls us forward, demanding why. She continues to get upset as everyone but her knew everything. Why was she the last one to find out? Why did everyone else get special treatment? Does nobody trust her? <sighs> okay. Okay, okay. Let me be fully honest here. I'm not gonna lie. When I first played this and Yuri said all that, I immediately dismissed it because the fact that she's so quickly able to just push everything else aside and make us feel like the bad guy. Like, do you want to know why we didn't tell you? It's because of this, of what you just did. Do you not fucking remember how you almost killed all of us? But after our second playthrough, I will admit that I was a bit too hard on her. My feelings haven't changed, but my outlook definitely has. Yes, Yuri is completely valid with her stance. It's completely realistic on why she'd be angry that literally everyone, including her bully and the person who held her life in their hands and some other random girl knew all of this before she did. I get that. That sucks. Why was she the last person to learn all this? I don't know. But that doesn't excuse her. Yuri, you're a fucking menace. Do you not realize all the times you got jealous over nothing and gave us the cold shoulder? We had an opportunity to tell you, but no, you just kept glaring at us and was like, Ugh, but you you cheated on me even though we're not even dating. Like, come on. Honestly, do you not remember every other bad thing that you've done? You can't sit here and be like, Oh, MC, you did this wrong, blah, blah, blah. Like, Yuri, do you want me to pull up the messages and the weird shit you sent us? And yes, I know, people deal with things differently, and that's probably why she's lashing out at us. I get that. Yuri, you're allowed to be mad at us, but please, my god, look in a fucking mirror. Yes, I know, we definitely made a mistake. We should have been friends for when we had the chance. I'll get into that later, but shit, I hate this moment so much. It really sucks, it gets me beyond angry. Yuri is acting aggressive, and everyone tries to hold her back. And the player is fed up. He yells at Yuri, fine, you want the truth? Then I'll show you the entire truth. And then he shows everyone Doki Doki Literature Club. He shows everyone the entire game. And Yuri is just not having it the entire time. Look, I get that you think this is all a lie, but look outside. Do you really think we're gonna continue to lie to you? You hit your fucking head already. So, yeah, they play through the game and the entire room is silent. Everyone reacts to it differently and... Yuri... Oh my god, Yuri. You wanna know what she fucking does? <laughs> So, first of all, she's still not having it, she looks bored out of her mind, and then goes to attack Monica, saying that everything is her fault. Oh my god, it's almost like she just turned her brain off to everything she didn't act to. Yuri then demands that we delete Monica, telling her that she doesn't deserve the player, and she knows it. Not after which she- Look, okay, I'm gonna stop you there. I'm gonna stop you there. I'm, I'm, I'm actually angry. Yuri, how about you tell the class what you just did this week? How about you tell them everything? Come on, show us! But, okay, okay. 
<sighs> okay. All right. So I don't agree with sharing the game with her. I feel like we should have done what we did for Natsuki and just try to continue to just challenge her. I guess we can't really merge a mage anymore, huh? Wait, but she believed that part anyways, right? Yeah, no, because she immediately was like, oh my god, you're real? Still, I feel like everyone should have banded together and tried talking to Yuri. I know she's incredibly irrational right now, but showing her the game should have been the last thing on her mind. Honestly, with the way that she's acting, it seems like that would have been the only choice. I want to sit here and believe that Yuri could calm down and listen to us, but nope. I don't even know what I do in this situation. I just keep screaming at her and telling her that she's being selfish and dumb as hell and that we are literally the last people in the world, so shut up. I honestly can't believe this is Yuri. She's 100% okay with, with Monica just dying and just continues to blame her. I guess that's better than taking responsibility, huh, Yuri? She then continues on saying that, oh, we're no hero, we lie, and we're killing everyone. Man, shut the fuck up. Honestly, you don't have the right. <sighs> okay, I need to calm down. So yeah, she demands that we delete Monica. Even though if you play the game, Yuri, you'd know that that's not going to fucking work because the world is doomed anyways. Do you not see what happened when the world restarted and Monica was deleted? Sayori then took over and the world was destroyed anyways because it's fucked. Think, Yuri, think. Natsuki thankfully says something. Thank you so much. I don't know why she's the only one. She calls out Yuri's bullshit saying that it's the script's fault. Thank you. And then Yuri is like, shut up Natsuki, you don't know anything. Bitch, you think you know something? You were the last one to find out. What makes you think you know anything? Shut up. Honestly, I could not be there right now. I'd be fighting Yuri. I'd be punching her. Everyone would need to hold me back because I'd slap the heck out of her. Monica then agrees to be deleted. How long until the air runs out? Until they run out of food? Until things change? The only way for things to change is for Monica to be deleted. Just like how the game wanted. Monica, this isn't the way. There's other options. There's still other things we can do. Monica, you're not like her. You're not a monster. Why isn't anyone saying anything? This isn't supposed to happen. There's still a way. Why is everyone going along with this? Monica goes to the computer and tries to delete herself, but the system rejects her. She can't do it. It needs to be us. We need to press that button. We need to delete Monica. <sighs> this is such bullshit. No, I refuse! Yuri, shut up! Monica, no, I won't! There's this unending silence as everyone just waits for this to be done. As everyone waits for Monica to be deleted. But, no. We go to the computer, right-click on the file, and delete it. Yes, I am sure. Monica, I'm sorry, but I won't do it. We hit enter and delete our own character file. Huh? Clouds. Moving so fast. Wait, what's this? Why am I... The air feels so thick, stale, oppressive. I can't hear a damn thing. What's going on? How did I get here? Is this the recycling bin? Hello? 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 Locked. And I don't have the key. <laughs> Must be my other body. That would have made you laugh. Right, Meiji? What do I do now? Where do I go now? Is there some place I should go? I don't know. What do I do? Can someone please tell me? Anyone? Is there something I'm missing here? Isn't there someone who can tell me? No voice, no prompt to tell me what to do here. Can't there be someone to help? Please, someone, anyone? What does a murderer like me do? The club room. The computer. It's on? <laughs> of course. There's no happiness to be found in the Ledger Club, huh? None of the DDLC players ever get a happy ending in the game. Only mods. <laughs> this isn't a mod, it's real life. There's no other choice, is there? I'm in the chair now, staring at the black screen.
And just like that, we're home. Man, I wanna cry. Monica rushes over and checks to see if we're okay. Everyone is here, and they're glad to see us. But how? How is this possible? Everyone comes to us one by one. Apparently we've been gone for three days. Yeah, that was careless of us, huh? Natsuki, you too? Okay, I was expecting Sayori to do it too, but I'm glad it's gone. Man, I have no words. There's so much to say, but how do we start? Where do we even begin? The player tries to apologize for what he's done, and Kotsunoa laughs at us. She commends us that we were able to do such a big thing just to save the one we love. We did it. We saved... Wait. Outside the window? What happened? Natsuki tells us that it looked like that as soon as we delete ourselves. Yuri then tells us that Monica was working non-stop to help save us. That's cool. Yuri, how about you fucking apologize? The player wonders if anyone is trying to hang the new game option. Yai says that they have, but they need admin privileges to do so. Meaning only the player is allowed to do it. Interesting that it really does need him. We look off at the computer and apparently Monica made her own setup by using the player's laptop in the main computer. Honestly, smart. The player suggests that we start a new game, and then everything turns dark. Everyone tries to compose themselves and find a light, and then the computer lights up. Next to lights, and then... Error? Every time someone pops up, it's an error. They look out the window and... The world? It's... It's back! Yet Monica appears, but it's another error. With nothing much to do, altogether we press new game. Another error. World of Dreams Act 2 not found. Application World of Dreams Act 2 not found? Delete? I'm speechless. Holy shit, am I actually crying? What the fuck? Oh my god, I... Holy shit. Is that it? Is that it? And that's it. That's the end of World of Dreams Act 2. Man, what a wild ride. I'm still speechless, that was so crazy. Alright, so what are my thoughts now that it's all over? Well, god dang, it's really good. The ending of Act 1 had a lot to live up to, and Act 2 easily picks up those pieces and continues to blow everything out of the water. Even weird choices that the characters make and missed opportunities, the writing easily holds everything together and surprises you with how wholesome, how cute, how serious, how dreadful, how hopeless, and how hopeful things can get. The writing is easily on par and sometimes surpasses the previous act and leaves you with wanting more. The setup and mystery holds on to you and always makes you wonder what will happen next. And it doesn't stop until the very end. The story knows what it's doing. It's all been planned out. There's always seeds being thrown at you and little questions that make you go, wait, was that important? The moments these characters share have so much heart and devotion that it truly feels like a lot of care was put into this. That is, until the mod has to complete its own story. One thing that was constantly on display was how often these characters would just move on to the next thing, to move on to the next scenario. This continued happening until the very end of the mod, looking at you, Yuri. Certain story beats that, yes, were written so perfectly feels like they don't belong and should have had more time in the oven. I still can't believe that Monica and the player's confession happened just as quickly as it ended. I can't believe that some characters have depth and we have a chance to explore it only for everyone else to remember that there's a story that we need to progress and we move on. It sometimes feels like this story is afraid of its own potential but also relishes in its own choices. Take for instance Yuri. As soon as you start the mod, she's the number one thing they're worried about, not wanting to get too close to her and trying to keep their friendship non-existent. Yet, at every opportunity, the player chooses to hear her out. An easy way to fix this would be for us to see that Yuri is more than just an obstacle, but no, time and time again, we disregard her and she ends up being reduced to a shell of her former self. Yes, she calls us out on every bad decision we've ever done, even going as far as to wanting to murder one of her friends. And then she gets off scot-free and doesn't get yelled at or really challenged at her thought process. I still can't believe that nobody decided to argue with her at the very end of the game and just let her talk. Even when reality was slapped in her face, she still causes problems for everyone. And as the mod goes on, things only get worse. Not just for the characters, but also it seems to be more disorganized. What the hell was up with Natsuki's dad? Same thing happened here. It showed up, was horrible to watch, and then it was gone. It had some lingering consequences, but then again, what isn't? The whole story is just trying to one-up itself to see who we can mentally break first. Was it shock value? Did they run out of time? Did the writers realize last minute that they had to tackle a bit of Natsuki's character arc so they had her father come and shoot the school? Was it just there so they could prolong the story? Because without that happening, we could have actually gotten to know Yuri and made 
made her feel more important. We then took the attention away to focus on Sean. The characters like to think that it was all important, but what about Kotonoa? The ugly duckling who doesn't have any reason to really be here. You'd think she'd be more important with everyone saying how much she controls the skull and manipulates everyone. You'd expect her to be some sort of final antagonist because of all the power she holds, but no. She's nothing more than an extra that is easily avoidable. Could have had a scene where her Yakuza family threatened the MC to join her dumb business. Get a little use out of the fact that yes, she is an evil queen and her minions do her bidding. What's the point of mentioning that her family is Yakuza if we're never gonna use that? But then again, what would the story even have time to do? The mod is already like 18 hours long, where can you put any of this in? This mod does a lot with its time, but at the same time it kinda doesn't. It starts building only to throw everything at the wall as the week progresses. It does so much, yet it doesn't give enough time for major payoffs. And it's so funny, because even though it feels like a checklist of story beats slowly being checked off, it still does those moments so well. It's hard to be angry when everything flows into each other so well. Whenever there's a low, it's always complemented by such an amazing high. I sit here and complain about some of the story structure and story beats, and yet I still love how they handle it. Because even at its weakest, it still does a lot of things right. It still has major payoffs. It never once leaves any character out of the count and always remembers to handle everything with nuance and care. We didn't need Sayori's mom being worried about her condition, yet it does so much for the rest of the story. We didn't need Sayori to do so much because she's basically not on the main cast anymore, but she not only stands on her own two feet, she also has her own goals and opinions. We didn't need for her to mention her depression because that happened last arc, yet we still take time to at least address how she's feeling. We didn't need Mori to find out or do much, yet she tries to do what she can and picks up the pieces when the player falls apart. Yes, you can replace her with any other character, but Mori has that extra bit of personality that helps her stand out a bit. It's not much, but it's there! We didn't need Kozu and Yai arguing every 5 minutes, but the story remembers that they have beef and they slowly work it out. We didn't need Kotonoa crying in her arms about how guilty she was over her actions when she was barely in the story, yet we took the time to hear her out and have her vent to us. We didn't need the player to be homesick, yet at his lowest he mentions how much he wants to go home, how the silly fantasy is starting to wear off. The story didn't need to do any of this, yet it still does. It's easy to say that you don't like a part in the story, it's even hard to explain why you don't like that specific part, and that's what I'm currently struggling with, because overall, this mod still did amazing. The music, the writing, the art, it's all very good, and even when I take off my rose tinted glasses, I could still see how much care was put into this. The story never really gets dull. Sure, towards the end it gets a bit repetitive, but it always keeps you on your toes. It always remains grounded regardless of what hoops and hurdles it has to go through. Even through all its problems, it still shines down brighter with more potential than ever. Okay, so here's my overview of what I thought of each of the characters. Starting with Sayori. I'm glad they didn't do the easy thing and just make her the cheerleader that helps everyone out and that's it. It would have been way easy for her just to be the guy in the chair and then for her to say, come on guys, let's do this. But no, the story gives her plenty of time to still be a character and many moments where she saves the day. And in many times, she's there to sort everyone out and help them. She's the glue for this team and she's always heard. Even when her opinions clash with other people, there's always a reason why. Even if she doesn't have a part in the story to play, she still does a lot of things that make her feel kind of important. Meiji is a bit on the weaker side. He doesn't get to do anything, obviously because he can't even control his own body, but also because he spends most, if not all of the mod, either sleeping or being sick. He rarely ever has his own opinion, only ever agreeing with whatever is happening. We do see potential where he tells the player that he wanted to side with Sayori when there was a bit of disagreement, but both options were good and didn't know what to pick. And that's kind of it. Yet he does have little moments with Sayori and the player where, where they poke fun at each other, but sometimes it feels like the story is reminding you that he's just here. I've mentioned it before, but a very easy change they could have done was to show that he had a bit of development and a little bit of an arc throughout the entire story. Basically, my idea is that at the beginning, Meiji is a bit scared of what's going to happen to him because he doesn't know or because of Yuri will try to do something with him. I don't know, something like that. And then the player tells him they have a job to do and we need to save everyone. We have to keep going. And then finally, at the final part, when the player wants to give up and he's completely breaking down, it's Meiji who repeats the words that the player told him. Meiji speaks to us and tells us that we need to keep going, but that we have to save everyone. Meiji having a stronger resolve would have been so cool to see and would have really made him feel prominent even when he isn't. It would have made it seem like everything really did have an impact on him, that he truly grew from all this. I think the biggest letdown is kind of the banter he has with the player. It still feels like they're both strangers, and granted, that's actually good, because they are, but I thought they would have been way closer by now. It's not all the time, but I really wanted them to just be bros, you know? I wanted them to be like brothers because they've been through a lot with each other. Everything the player is going through, Meiji is going through the exact same thing. And yet, for some reason, they still sometimes act like they're on a first date and where they're both trying to make a good first impression on each other and they're acting overly cautious and not really showing their other sides to each other. Does that make sense? I want more from Meiji. I want him to stand on his own TV. That's what I want. 
Monica goes through a lot of changes, but at the same time, she doesn't. Her character feels mostly stagnant and makes little changes. Overall, she's the same person she was in the beginning, but at the same time, she kinda isn't. There's a lot of differences with the way she approaches things now. By the end of the story, she feels a bit more sure of herself, but also doesn't? It's a weird back and forth that the story can't really decide on. There's these moments where she's incredibly strong and smart, like her first meeting with Yuri, then the curtain falls and she's incredibly emotional. However, I think that's kind of her character. She leans on this perfect persona of herself, but she's still dealing with the idea that she's a monster. She still wants nothing more than to prove that she isn't, and to be seen and be trusted by everyone, and for someone to lean on. So she has her moments, yes, and then she doesn't. She's complex, but easy to understand. And towards the end of the story, when you expect her to act a certain way, instead she surprises you. You see the little things that happen and makes you realize that slowly but surely, she is getting better. Yes, she has her moments and sometimes it infuriates me. Why did she listen to Yai and let her get in her head? Why was the first instinct of the player acting irrational for her to off herself? I can forgive the first time, but not, not the second. We all do stupid things when we're emotional, but Monica is always willing to listen to us. Even through the worst misunderstandings, it doesn't take much for her to be on our side again and for us to move on with the story. I still stand by what I said before, after the incident with Yai, they should have talked it out, yes, but not fully forgive each other. Let Monica be conflicted for a little bit and let things be awkward with them while they deal with Yai and Mori. And then at the end of the night when they both have to go to bed, they're awkward because now they're alone and now they're just kind of left with their feelings. And it would have been so cool if they both realized that they had nothing to worry about after all. And that as soon as they try talking to each other, they realize that, wait, why are we fighting with each other? We both miss each other. And then they realize that they're both fine. That even though they've hurt each other, they still love each other and it was all just a mistake. That would have been such a beautiful scene for all that build up and tension to instantly just be thrown off our shoulders because they're fine. They realize that they love each other and that mistakes can happen. That would make me believe in their love. That would make me want to root for them even more. I'm sorry, but cute moments don't really define a relationship. It's their trials and errors that do. But man, they are cute together, I'm not gonna lie. Natsuki. She didn't get to do much. In the beginning, she was just your basic tsundere who we're trying to get the trust of. I did like how we kept running into her at the vending machine, and I like how she would actually be frustrated at things and actually be vocal about the situation. When she found out about the rumors, she was kind of disgusted by us while we were trying to explain stuff. She was like, I got an eye on you, buddy. <laughs> and when she got her memories back, she was a great addition to the group. It felt like she was kind of missing the entire time. She brought a different kind of energy to some of the meetings that was somehow lacking. And what I mean is that everyone always had this kind of like serious, worried expression almost all the time. And only Sayori would be the one to kind of change up the mood every once in a while, or Monica with her constant flirting. Natsuki did a lot to change this dynamic up, and I wish it lasted a little bit longer. I also love certain moments that she had with certain characters. I also love her whole speech she had with Yuri when she was going bonkers, and I'm glad that she called Yuri out when Yuri wanted to leave Monica. Yes, she really doesn't do much, but she's a nice addition, and she never really felt out of place. I do think randomly shoving her character arc, if you even want to call it that, was kind of a bad play. Personally for me, I would have made Natsuki's dad be the final trump card, the ultimate final climax of the game. Yuri should have been a red herring all along, and the finale should have been a whole shootout with Natsuki's dad going wild. Does that sound crazy? Yes, but at the same time, this whole mod is crazy. Cause like, if you're going to include Natsuki's dad, then do him right. Have him be the final obstacle. Honestly, make him work for Kotonoa's family or something, right? That kills two birds with one stone, cause not only does it make Kotonoa's presence more threatening, it also gives a reason on why Natsuki's dad would have a gun, and why he's going bonkers. Imagine Kotonoa was behind all of this and was commanding Natsuki's dad. Imagine she was the one that tipped him off about Natsuki. That would have been so sick and made his inclusion so much better because oh shit, now Natsuki's dad knows. We have to hurry, we have to hide Natsuki, and then bam, he's here. And now it's like shit, we're out of time. And now we're worried about protecting Natsuki and it's a, it's a whole thing. That would have been so cool. Speaking of Kotonoa, she's incredibly underused. The entire mod was basically, oh, remember her? Yeah, she's dangerous. We should steer clear. Got it. And then we forget about it. I do like how she would pop up and try to assert her dominance, but it's too little too late. There was no real reason to ever be scared. She was never this looming threat that the characters made her seem like. If we saw how bad Kotonoa was, I would have cared more for Yuri's mother, who, might I remind you, was getting screwed over by Kotonoa's family. If we saw that more, it would have not only helped the world building, but also help us get more attached to these characters. And as I said before, having Kotonoa be the final villain instead of of Yuri would make so much more sense. Imagine everyone banding together to talk sense into her and trying to figure out if she's, if she's even worth saving cause look, she screwed over Yuri and her mom, she could have tipped off Natsuki's dad about what happened and caused this whole situation and she was about to buy the school for rich people money. But nope! Instead, she's just nothing. I am happy that she does get a moment where she reflects and gets to vent. That's some very much needed time for her character. 
Up next is Mori. Mori is fine, she didn't really get to do much, she doesn't really do anything for the group, honestly, other than make them meals and bring them food. Regardless though, she does get some really solid moments, like where she's able to show off her character a little bit, and I love how she's just as affected to everything as Monica and Sayori is. Natsuki and Kozu are mostly fine, with maybe a few hiccups over there, but we actually get to dive in a little bit with Mori. That moment where she messes up the dinner hits so hard, and I love the little lore bits that we get with the whole two voices in her head. She may not contribute much, but at least she does something. Can't say the same for Kozu. It's just fine, I think. She literally doesn't really do anything. She's the first real plot hook with, of the game with her being suspicious for looking at the Sayori's house. And then it's revealed that she actually remembers everything. And that's kind of it. There's nothing else added to her character other than her beef with Yai. Yeah, she does sort of have an arc with, being, with slowly being able to deal, not forgive, but deal with Yai. But that's not even necessarily her thing. That's more Yai's story than it is her. Kozu doesn't really change or say anything that helps the group or anything. So what exactly makes Kozu special? Not much. She's definitely the weakest link, but hey, she smashed the pot on Natsuki's head, so that was pretty cool. I definitely don't hate her, but there's just not much to really say about her. Yai, however, is such a surprise and I'm all here for it. I didn't expect to like her so much or really root for her at all. Starting off as a bully to someone who wants forgiveness is crazy and, I, and she only gets a lot of time in the spotlight. You could say that her development happens a bit too fast, but in reality, she always had a reason to be better. She just never did because nobody wanted to help her. It doesn't really happen overnight. It does start off with her being incredibly rude and stubborn to finally coming around and even then, she does still have her moments where she falls back into bad habits and she's like, oh right, sorry. Truly, all she needed was a little push and she got it, and I'm glad we got to explore that side of her character. I also appreciate the little changes we make she makes to the group when she first joins. As I mentioned before, everyone was kind of too serious, rightfully so, but having her there made a slight difference and it was appreciated. It didn't last long, but it was cool to have her involved for a little while. <sighs> Alright, let's talk about Yuri. A part of me wants to understand what they did with her character, but by the time you get to the ending, it was a full-on character assassination. Yes, I understand, she feels betrayed. She was incredibly emotional, it was the first time she had ever gotten like that, and it should have been a whoa, didn't expect that, but you still can't expect me to sit here and take everything she said at 100% face value, just, no, I can't. If you really wanted me to act like, oh shit, you know what, Yuri's kind of right, then maybe you should have had it actually make sense. Let me explain a little bit. What should have been done was that, yes, let's hype up Yuri to be this unstoppable force and then let's subvert our expectations. You're already doing it by showing us more of her life and, and seeing how much she's suffering because of her mother's condition. I truly wish that instead of the player continuing to ignore her, he should have treated her like he treated Yai. He finally looks at her, not the monster she's going to become, not the final antagonist, but this lonely girl who's suffering. When Yuri cried to the MC, that should have been the wake-up call. We should have been trying to support her and help her through her problems. Let's get attached to Yuri so when her fall from grace happens, it's an oh shit moment. It also would add more drama because now, the player is switching gears and saying that he should spend more time with her. Maybe Monica and Sayori argue a little bit but overall try to push trust into him. And then when Yuri eventually goes crazy and the player is hating himself for being stupid and saying that, oh, Monica and Sayori, you were right, we shouldn't have been friends with her. Monica and Sayori instead will be like, no, you did the right thing, can still call out to her. I guarantee you that Yuri's shift in personality would have been so sad and tragic if we got to see it. Instead, it's a, oh wow, look, she's stalking us now, and oh no, she sent us nudes, that's crazy. The bathroom scene where we catch her in the act would have hit so hard if we kept calling out to her, if she really did try snapping out of it but to no avail. Also, I just want to point out, there was an organic way for their friendship to happen. You know how Meiji is sick for the entire mod? What if that actually mattered? <laughs> what if that actually mattered? I know, crazy. <laughs> what if we went to the hospital because we got so sick and oh no, look, we just so happen to be in the same hospital as Yuri's mom. I know it's not really how hospitals work because she's really sick, but uh, ignore that. Then we interact with Yuri and see more sides of her and we get to know the real her before everything changes. And that would also make Yuri's mother's words matter. Do you remember what she told us? I don't because it really didn't matter. I wish her words weighed heavier on the player's subconscious. Yuri's mother's death should have mattered more and Yuri's spiral should have mattered more. I know it'd be cliche to have the whole power of friendship to make Yuri get to her senses, but she also needs that more than anyone. Also, I find it so frustrating that she never once is like, what have I done? I really can't believe she just gets a free pass for everything she did while being crazy. Why was she so quick to blame everyone else and then tell Monica to off herself? And then when the player comes back from death, all she has to say is, Monica's been working tirelessly to bring you back. Like, no, I'm sorry, no nothing, no explanation on how you couldn't control yourself or you were just angry or you were justifying your actions or anything. We just move on. I honestly can't believe that. For God's sake, we let Kotano advent to us when she was barely in the story, but not Yuri? You honestly gotta be kidding me, right meow. But yeah, you get it, she had potential, it's whatever.
The player. He's fine, he has some really good moments and then some weird ones. I like his arc of slowly spiraling and getting so sick of everything and then making the ultimate sacrifice. That's cool, I'm a sucker for those kind of stories. I do wish though that his breakdown was more of a build up rather than only really appearing in the latter half of the story. I do like how the script also affects him and his bad traits also get amplified. I don't really like though how he automatically knew this from the beginning though. I feel like it would have been a huge shock if he was like, oh shit, I can get affected by the script too. Even though it's funny because I don't belong here, wow. I really like the nightmare sequence. I think it did wonders for him and I love being able to see that side of him. I'm also glad that the characters did call him out for his choices and he did try to learn and keep his promises. And then he doesn't keep his promises. <laughs> to be fair though, he was set up to lose in the beginning. It's not even fair how Act 2 just kept throwing tragedy after tragedy for no other reason than to mess up the characters. And honestly, being stuck in that world would just be awful. But yeah, for the most part, there's nothing I really change about him. I like him. I think he fits the story well, and I think he does what he can. I can sit here and nitpick all day like, oh, I would have done this differently, but this is just a story. It has to have some drama, and the, and the player is very much still human. Of course, he's going to make mistakes and be a little dumb, and that's fine. What makes a story is the journey, and I'm still very much looking forward to what the story has in store. But yeah, that's everything I thought about the story. What a journey this has been. I can't believe how much time I've invested in this video. My god, this is so long. Please let me know what you all think in the comments below. I really do love this story and I really can't wait for what happens next.